Section 7a of the History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard, Part 3, The Union and National Politics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christy Nowak. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard, Part 3, Section 7a. Chapter 7. The Formation of the Constitution. The Promise and the Difficulties of America. The rise of a young republic, composed of thirteen states, each governed by officials popularly elected under constitutions drafted by the plain people, was the most significant feature of the eighteenth century. The majority of the patriots whose labors and sacrifices had made this possible naturally looked upon their work and pronounced it good those americans however who peered beneath the surface of things saw that the declaration of independence even if splendidly phrased and paper constitutions drawn by finest enthusiasm uninstructed by experience could not alone make the republic great and prosperous or even free all around them they saw chaos in finance and in industry and perils for the immediate future the government under the Articles of Confederation had neither the strength nor the resources necessary to cope with the problems of reconstruction left by the war. The sole organ of government was a Congress composed of from two to seven members from each state chosen as the legislature might direct and paid by the state. In determining all questions, each state had one vote. Delaware thus enjoyed the same weight as Virginia. There was no president to enforce the laws. The Congress was given power to select a committee of thirteen, one from each state, to act as an executive body when it was not in session, but this device, on being tried out, proved a failure. There was no system of national courts to which citizens and states could appeal for the protection of their rights or through which they could compel obedience to law. The two great powers of government, military and financial, were withheld. Congress, it is true, could authorize expenditures, but had to rely upon the states for the payment of contributions to meet its bills. It could also order the establishment of an army, but it could only request the states to supply their respective quotas of soldiers. It could not lay taxes, nor bring any pressure to bear upon a single citizen in the whole country. It could act only through the medium of the state governments. Financial and Commercial Disorders in the field of public finance the disorders were pronounced the huge debt incurred during the war was still outstanding congress was unable to pay either the interest or the principal public creditors were in despair as the market value of their bonds sank to twenty-five or even ten cents on the dollar the current bills of congress were unpaid as someone complained there was not enough money in the treasury to buy pen and ink with which to record the transactions of the shadow legislature the currency was in utter chaos. Millions of dollars in notes issued by Congress had become mere trash worth a cent or two on the dollar. There was no other expression of contempt so forceful as the popular saying, not worth a continental. To make matters worse, several of the states were pouring new streams of paper money from the press. Almost the only good money in circulation consisted of English, French, and Spanish coins, and the public was even defrauded by them because money changers were busy clipping and filing away the metal. Foreign commerce was unsettled. The entire British system of trade discrimination was turned against the Americans, and Congress, having no power to regulate foreign commerce, was unable to retaliate or to negotiate treaties which it could enforce. Domestic commerce was impeded by the jealousies of the states, which erected tariff barriers against their neighbors. The condition of the currency made the exchange of money and goods extremely difficult, and, as if to increase the confusion, backward states enacted laws hindering the prompt collection of debts within their borders, an evil which nothing but a national system of courts could cure. Congress in Disrepute with treaties set at naught by the states, the laws unenforced, the treasury empty, and the public credit gone, the Congress of the United States fell into utter disrepute. It called upon the states to pay their quotas of money into the treasury, only to be treated with contempt. Even its own members looked upon it as a solemn futility. Some of the ablest men refused to accept election to it, and many who did take the doubtful honor failed to attend the sessions. Again and again it was impossible to secure a quorum for the transaction of business. 
Troubles of the State Governments The State Governments, free to pursue their own course with no interference from without, had almost as many difficulties as the Congress. They were too loaded with revolutionary debts calling for heavy taxes upon an already restive population, oppressed by their financial burdens, and discouraged by the fall in prices which followed the return of peace. The farmers of several states joined in a concerted effort and compelled their legislatures to issue large sums of paper money. The currency fell in value, but nevertheless it was forced on unwilling creditors to square old accounts. In every part of the country, legislative action fluctuated violently. Laws were made one year only to be repealed the next and reenacted the third year. Lands were sold by one legislature, and the sales were cancelled by its successor. Uncertainty and distrust were the natural consequences. Men of substance longed for some power that would forbid states to issue bills of credit, to make paper money legal tender in payment of debts, or to impair the obligation of contracts. Men heavily in debt, on the other hand, urged even more drastic action against creditors. So great did the discontent of the farmers in New Hampshire become in 1786 that a mob surrounded the legislature, demanding a repeal of the taxes and the issuance of paper money. It was with difficulty that an armed rebellion was avoided. In Massachusetts, the malcontents, under the leadership of Daniel Shays, a captain in the Revolutionary Army, organized that same year open resistance to the government of the state. Shays and his followers protested against the conduct of creditors in foreclosing mortgages upon the debt-burdened farmers, against the lawyers for increasing the cost of legal proceedings, against the Senate of the state, the members of which were apportioned among the towns on the basis of the amount of taxes paid against heavy taxes, and against the refusal of the legislature to issue paper money. They seized the town of Worcester and Springfield, and broke up the courts of justice. All through the western part of the state the revolt spread, sending a shock of alarm to every center and section of the young republic. Only by the most vigorous action was Governor Bowdoin able to quell the uprising, and when that task was accomplished, the state government did not dare to execute any of the prisoners, because they had so many sympathizers. Moreover, Bowdoin and several members of the legislature, who had been most zealous in their attacks on the insurgents, were defeated at the ensuing election. The need of national assistance for state governments in times of domestic violence was everywhere emphasized by men who were opposed to revolutionary acts. Alarm over dangers to the Republic Leading American citizens, watching the drift of affairs, were slowly driven to the conclusion that the new ship of state, so proudly launched a few years before, was careening into anarchy. "'The facts of our peace and independence,' wrote a friend of Washington, "'do not at present wear so promising an appearance as I had fondly painted in my mind. The prejudices, jealousies, and turbulence of the people at times almost stagger my confidence in our political establishments.' and almost occasion me to think that they will show themselves unworthy of the noble prize for which we have contended. Washington himself was profoundly discouraged. On hearing of Shays' rebellion, he exclaimed, What, gracious God, is man, that there should be such inconsistency and perfidiousness in his conduct? It is but the other day that we were shedding our blood to obtain the constitutions under which we now live, constitutions of our own choice and making, and now we are unsheathing our sword to overturn them. The same year he burst out in a lament over the rumors of restoring royal government. I am told that even respectable characters speak of a monarchical government without horror, from thinking proceeds speaking, hence to acting is often but a single step. But how irresistible and tremendous! What a triumph for our enemies to verify their predictions! What a triumph for the advocates of despotism to find that we are incapable of governing ourselves! Congress attempts some reforms. The Congress was not indifferent to the events that disturbed Washington. On the contrary, it put forth many efforts to check tendencies so dangerous to finance, commerce, industries, and the Confederation itself. In 1781, even before the Treaty of Peace was signed, the Congress, having found out how futile were its taxing powers, carried a resolution of amendment to the Articles of Confederation, authorizing the levy of a moderate duty on imports. Yet this mild measure was rejected by the states. Two years later, the Congress prepared another amendment sanctioning the levy of duties on imports, to be collected this time by state officers and applied to the payment of the public debt. 
this more limited proposal, designed to save public credit, likewise failed. In 1786, the Congress made a third appeal to the states for help, declaring that they had been so irregular and so negligent in paying their quotas that further reliance upon that mode of raising revenues was dishonorable and dangerous. The Calling of a Constitutional Convention Hamilton and Washington Urge Reform The attempts at reform by the Congress were accompanied by demand for, both within and without that body, a convention to frame a new plan of government. In 1780, the youthful Alexander Hamilton, realizing the weakness of the articles so widely discussed, proposed a general convention for the purpose of drafting a new constitution on entirely different principles. With tireless energy, he strove to bring his countrymen to his view. Washington, agreeing with him on every point, declared in a circular letter to the governors that the duration of the Union would be short unless there was lodged somewhere a supreme power to regulate and govern the general concerns of the Confederated Republic. The governor of Massachusetts, disturbed by the growth of discontent all about him, suggested to the state legislature in 1785 the advisability of a national convention to enlarge the powers of Congress. The legislature approved the plan, but did not press it to a conclusion. The Annapolis Convention Action finally came from the South. The Virginia legislature, taking things into its own hands, called a conference of delegates at Annapolis to consider matters of taxation and commerce. When the convention assembled in 1786, it was found that only five states had taken the trouble to send representatives. The leaders were deeply discouraged, but the resourceful Hamilton, a delegate from New York, turned the affair to good account. He secured the adoption of a resolution calling upon the Congress itself to summon another convention to meet at Philadelphia. A National Convention Called, 1787 The Congress, as tardy as ever, at last decided in February, 1787, to issue the call. Fearing drastic changes, however, it restricted the convention to the sole and express purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation. Jealous of its own powers, it added that any alterations proposed should be referred to the Congress and the states for their approval. Every state in the Union, except Rhode Island, responded to this call. Indeed, some of the states, having the Annapolis Resolution before them, had already anticipated the Congress by selecting delegates before the formal summons came. Thus, by the persistence of governors, legislatures, and private citizens, there was brought about the long-desired National Convention. In May, 1787, it assembled in Philadelphia. The Eminent Men of the Convention On the roll of that memorable convention were fifty-five men, at least half of whom were acknowledged to be among the foremost statesmen and thinkers in America. Every field of statecraft was represented by them. War and practical management in Washington, who was chosen president of the convention, Diplomacy in Franklin, now old and full of honor in his own land as well as abroad, finance in Alexander Hamilton and Robert Morris, law in James Wilson of Pennsylvania, the philosophy of government in James Madison, called the father of the Constitution. They were not theorists, but practical men, rich in political experience and endowed with deep insight into the springs of human action. Three of them had served in the Stamp Act Congress, Dickinson of Delaware, William Samuel Johnson of Connecticut, and John Rutledge of South Carolina. Eight had been signers of the Declaration of Independence, Reed of Delaware, Sherman of Connecticut, Wythe of Virginia, Jerry of Massachusetts, Franklin, Robert Morris, George Clymer, and James Wilson of Pennsylvania. All but twelve had at some time served in the Continental Congress, and eighteen were members of that body in the spring of 1787. Washington, Hamilton, Mifflin, and Charles Pinckney had been officers in the Revolutionary Army. Seven of the delegates had gained political experience as governors of states. The convention as a whole, according to historian Hildreth, represented in a marked manner the talent, intelligence, and especially the conservative sentiment of the country. End of section 7a Section 2 of History of the United States 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Katie Gibney. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard. Part 3, Section 2. Part 3. THE UNION AND NATIONAL POLITICS CHAPTER Seven: THE FORMATION OF THE CONSTITUTION THE PROMISE AND THE DIFFICULTIES OF AMERICA THE FRAMING OF THE CONSTITUTION PROBLEMS INVOLVED THE GREAT PROBLEMS BEFORE THE CONVENTION WERE NINE IN NUMBER. 1. SHALL THE ARTICLES OF CONFEDERATION BE REVISED OR A NEW SYSTEM OF GOVERNMENT CONSTRUCTED? 2. Shall the government be founded on states equal in power, as under the Articles, or on the broader and deeper foundation of population? 3. What direct share shall the people have in the election of national officers? 4. What shall be the qualifications for the suffrage? 5. How shall the conflicting interests of the commercial and the planting states be balanced so as to safeguard the essential rights of each. 6. What shall be the form of the new government? 7. What power shall be conferred on it? 8. How shall the state legislatures be restrained from their attacks on property rights, such as the issuance of paper money? 9. Shall the approval of all the states be necessary, as under the Articles, for the adoption and amendment of the Constitution, revision of the Articles, or a new government. The moment the first problem was raised, representatives of the small states, led by William Patterson of New Jersey, were on their feet. They feared that, if the Articles were overthrown, the equality and rights of the states would be put in jeopardy. Their protest was therefore vigorous. They cited the call issued by the Congress in summoning the Convention, which specifically stated that they were assembled for the sole and express purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation. They also cited their instructions from their state legislatures, which authorized them to revise and amend the existing scheme of government, not to make a revolution in it. To depart from the authorization laid down by the Congress and the legislatures would be to exceed their powers, they argued, and to betray the trust reposed in them by their countrymen. To their contentions, Randolph of Virginia replied, When the salvation of the Republic is at stake, it would be treason to our trust not to propose what we find necessary. Hamilton reminding the delegates that their work was still subject to the approval of the states, frankly said that on the point of their powers he had no scruples. With the issue clear, the convention cast aside the articles as if they did not exist, and proceeded to the work of drawing up a new constitution, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to the delegates seemed most likely to affect their safety and happiness. A government founded on states or people. The Compromise. Defeated in their attempt to limit the convention to a mere revision of the Articles, the spokesmen of the smaller states redoubled their efforts to preserve the equality of the states. The signal for a radical departure from the Articles on this point was given early in the sessions, when Randolph presented the Virginia Plan. He proposed that the new national legislature consist of two houses, the members of which were to be apportioned among the states according to their wealth or free white population, as the convention might decide. This plan was vehemently challenged. Patterson of New Jersey flatly avowed that neither he nor his state would ever bow to such tyranny. As an alternative, he presented the New Jersey Plan calling for a national legislature of one house representing states as such, not wealth or people, a legislature in which all states, large or small, would have equal voice. Wilson of Pennsylvania, 
on behalf of the more populous states, took up the gauntlet which Patterson had thrown down. It was absurd, he urged, for 180,000 men in one state to have the same weight in national councils as 750,000 men in another state. The gentleman from New Jersey, he said, is candid. He declares his opinion boldly. I will be equally candid. I will never confederate on his principles. So the bitter controversy ran on through many exciting sessions. Greek had met Greek. The convention was hopelessly deadlocked and on the verge of dissolution, scarce held together by the strength of a hair, as one of the delegates remarked. A crash was averted only by a compromise. Instead of a Congress of one house, as provided by the Articles, the convention agreed upon a legislature of two houses. In the Senate, the aspirations of the small states were to be satisfied for each state was given two members in that body. In the formation of the House of Representatives, the larger states were placated, for it was agreed that the members of that chamber were to be apportioned among the states on the basis of population, counting three-fifths of the slaves. THE QUESTION OF POPULAR ELECTION The method of selecting federal officers and members of Congress also produced an acrimonious debate which revealed how deep-seated was the distrust of the capacity of the people to govern themselves. THE QUESTION OF POPULAR ELECTION The method of selecting federal officers and members of Congress also produced an acrimonious debate which revealed how deep-seated was the distrust of the capacity of the people to govern themselves. Few there were who believed that no branch of the government should be elected directly by the voters. Still fewer were there, however, who desired to see all branches so chosen. One or two even expressed a desire for a monarchy. The dangers of democracy were stressed by Jerry of Massachusetts. All the evils we experience flow from an excess of democracy. The people do not want virtue, but are the dupes of pretended patriots. I have been too Republican heretofore, but have been taught by experience the danger of a leveling spirit. To the democratic licentiousness of the state legislatures, Randolph sought to oppose a firm Senate. To check the excesses of popular government, Charles Pinckney of South Carolina declared that no one should be elected president who was not worth one hundred thousand dollars, and that high property qualifications should be placed on members of Congress and judges. Other members of the convention were stoutly opposed to such high-toned notions of government. Franklin and Wilson, both from Pennsylvania, vigorously championed popular election, while men like Madison insisted that at least one part of the government should rest on the broad foundation of the people. Out of this clash of opinion also came compromise. One branch, the House of Representatives, it was agreed, was to be elected directly by the voters, while the senators were to be elected indirectly by the state legislatures. The president was to be chosen by electors selected as the legislatures of the states might determine, and the judges of the federal courts, supreme and inferior, by the president and the Senate. THE QUESTION OF THE SUFFRAGE the battle over the suffrage was sharp but brief. Governor Morris proposed that only landowners should be permitted to vote. Madison replied that the state legislatures, which had made so much trouble with radical laws, were elected by freeholders. After the debate, the delegates, unable to agree on any property limitations on the suffrage, decided that the House of Representatives should be elected by voters having the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. Thus they accepted the suffrage provisions of the states. The Balance Between the Planting and the Commercial States After the debates had gone on for a few weeks, Madison came to the conclusion that the real division in the convention was not between the large and the small states, but between the planting section founded on slave labor and the commercial north. 
Thus he anticipated, by nearly three-quarters of a century, the irrepressible conflict. The planting states had neither the free white population nor the wealth of the North. There were, counting Delaware, six of them as against seven commercial states, dependent for their prosperity mainly upon the sale of tobacco, rice, and other stables abroad, they feared that Congress might impose restraints upon their enterprise. Being weaker in numbers, they were afraid that the majority might lay an unfair burden of taxes upon them. REPRESENTATION AND TAXATION The Southern members of the Convention were therefore very anxious to secure for their section the largest possible representation in Congress, and at the same time to restrain the taxing power of that body. Two devices were thought adapted to these ends. One was to count the slaves as people when apportioning representatives among the states according to their respective populations. The other was to provide that direct taxes should be apportioned among the states in proportion not to their wealth but to the number of their free white inhabitants. For obvious reasons, the northern delegates objected to these proposals. Once more a compromise proved to be the solution. It was agreed that not all the slaves, but three-fifths of them, should be counted for both purposes, representation and direct taxation. Commerce and the Slave Trade Southern interests were also involved in the project to confer upon Congress the power to regulate interstate and foreign commerce. To the manufacturing and trading states this was essential. It would prevent interstate tariffs and trade jealousies. It would enable Congress to protect American manufacturers and to break down, by appropriate retaliations, foreign discriminations against American commerce. To the South the proposal was menacing because tariffs might interfere with the free exchange of the produce of plantations in European markets, and navigation acts might confine the carrying trade to American that is, northern, ships. The importation of slaves, moreover, it was feared might be heavily taxed or immediately prohibited altogether. The result of this and related controversies was a debate on the merits of slavery. Governor Morris delivered his mind and heart on that subject, denouncing slavery as a nefarious institution and the curse of heaven on the states in which it prevailed. Mason of Virginia, a slaveholder himself, was hardly less outspoken, saying, Slavery discourages arts and manufacturers. The poor despise labor when performed by slaves. They prevent the migration of whites who really strengthen and enrich a country. The system, however, had its defenders. Representatives from South Carolina argued that their entire economic life rested on slave labor and that the high death rate in the rice swamps made continuous importation necessary. Ellsworth of Connecticut took the ground that the convention should not meddle with slavery. The morality or wisdom of slavery, he said, are considerations belonging to the states. What enriches a part enriches the whole. To the future he turned an untroubled face. As population increases, Poor laborers will be so plenty as to render slaves useless. Slavery in time will not be a speck in our country. Virginia and North Carolina, already overstocked with slaves, favored prohibiting the traffic in them. But South Carolina was adamant. She must have fresh supplies of slaves or she would not federate. So it was agreed that, while Congress might regulate foreign trade by majority vote, the importation of slaves should not be forbidden before the lapse of twenty years, and that any import tax should not exceed ten dollars a head. At the same time, in connection with the regulation of foreign trade, it was stipulated that a two-thirds vote in the Senate should be necessary in the ratification of treaties. A further concession to the South was made in the provision for the return of runaway slaves, a provision also useful in the North, where indentured servants were about as troublesome as slaves in escaping from their masters. THE FORM OF THE GOVERNMENT As to the details of the frame of government and the grand principles involved, 
the opinion of the convention ebbed and flowed, decisions being taken in the heat of debate, only to be revoked and taken again. THE EXECUTIVE There was general agreement that there should be an executive branch. For reliance upon Congress to enforce its own laws and treaties had been a broken reed. On the character and functions of the executive, however, there were many views. The New Jersey plan called for a council selected by the Congress. The Virginia plan provided that the executive branch should be chosen by the Congress, but did not state whether it should be composed of one or several persons. On this matter the convention voted first one way, and then another. Finally it agreed on a single executive chosen indirectly by electors, selected as the state legislatures might decide, serving for four years, subject to impeachment, and endowed with regal powers in the command of the army and the navy, and in the enforcement of the laws. THE LEGISLATIVE BRANCH, CONGRESS After the convention had made the great compromise between the large and small commonwealths, by giving representation to states in the Senate and to population in the House, the question of methods of election had to be decided. As to the House of Representatives, it was readily agreed that the members should be elected by direct popular vote. There was also easy agreement on the proposition that a strong Senate was needed to check the turbulence of the lower house. Four devices were finally selected to accomplish this purpose. In the first place, the senators were not to be chosen directly by the voters, but by the legislatures of the states, thus removing their election one degree from the populace. In the second place, their term was fixed at six years instead of two, as in the case of the house. In the third place, provision was made for continuity by having only one-third of the members go out at a time, while two-thirds remained in service. Finally, it was provided that senators must be at least thirty years old, while representatives need be only twenty-five. THE JUDICIARY The need for federal courts to carry out the laws was hardly open to debate. The feebleness of the Articles of Confederation was, in a large measure, attributed to the want of a judiciary to hold states and individuals in obedience to the laws and treaties of the Union. Nevertheless, on this point, the advocates of states' rights were extremely sensitive. They looked with distrust upon judges appointed at the national capital and emancipated from local interests and traditions. They remembered with what insistence they had claimed against Britain the right of local trials by jury, and with what consternation they had viewed the proposal to make colonial judges independent of the assemblies in the matter of their salaries. Reluctantly they yielded to the demand for federal courts, consenting at first only to a Supreme Court to review cases heard in lower state courts and finally to such additional inferior courts as Congress might deem necessary. THE SYSTEM OF CHECKS AND BALANCES It is thus apparent that the framers of the Constitution, in shaping the form of government, arranged for a distribution of power among three branches, executive, legislative, and judicial. Strictly speaking, we might say four branches, for the legislature or Congress was composed of two houses, elected in different ways, and one of them, the Senate, was made a check on the President through its power of ratifying treaties and appointments. The accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judicial, in the same hands, wrote Madison, whether of one, a few, or many, and whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. The devices which the convention adopted to prevent such a centralization of authority were exceedingly ingenious and well calculated to accomplish the purposes of the authors. The legislature consisted of two houses, the members of which were to be apportioned on a different basis, elected in different ways, and to serve for different terms. 
A veto on all its acts was vested in a president elected in a manner not employed in the choice of either branch of the legislature, serving for four years, and subject to removal only by the difficult process of impeachment. After a law had run the gauntlet of both houses and the executive, it was subject to interpretation and annulment by the judiciary, appointed by the president with the consent of the Senate and serving for life. Thus it was made almost impossible for any political party to get possession of all branches of the government at a single popular election. As Hamilton remarked, the friends of good government considered every institution calculated to restrain the excess of law-making and to keep things in the same state in which they happen to be at any given period as more likely to do good than harm. THE POWERS OF THE FEDERAL GOVERNMENT On the question of the powers to be conferred upon the new government, there was less occasion for a serious dispute. Even the delegates from the small states agreed with those from Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and Virginia that new powers should be added to those entrusted to Congress by the Articles of Confederation. The New Jersey plan, as well as the Virginia plan, recognized this fact. Some of the delegates, like Hamilton and Madison, even proposed to give Congress a general legislative authority covering all national matters. But others, frightened by the specter of nationalism, insisted on specifying each power to be conferred and finally carried the day. Taxation and Commerce There were none bold enough to dissent from the proposition that revenue must be provided to pay current expenses and discharge the public debt. When once the dispute over the apportionment of direct taxes among the slave states was settled, it was an easy matter to decide that Congress should have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises. In this way the national government was freed from dependence upon stubborn and tardy legislatures and enabled to collect funds directly from the citizens. There were likewise none bold enough to contend that the anarchy of state tariffs and trade discriminations should be longer endured. When the fears of the planting states were allayed and the bargain over the importation of slaves was reached, the convention vested in Congress the power to regulate foreign and interstate commerce. National Defense The necessity for national defense was realized though the fear of huge military establishments was equally present. The old practice of relying on quotas furnished by the state legislatures was completely discredited. As in the case of taxes, a direct authority over citizens was demanded. Congress was therefore given full power to raise and support armies and a navy. It could employ the state militia when desirable, but it could at the same time maintain a regular army and call directly upon all able-bodied males if the nature of a crisis was thought to require it. The Necessary and Proper Clause To the specified power vested in Congress by the Constitution, the advocates of a strong national government added a general clause authorizing it to make all laws necessary and proper for carrying into effect any and all of the enumerated powers. This clause interpreted by that mastermind, Chief Justice Marshall, was later construed to confer powers as wide as the requirements of a vast country spanning a continent and taking its place among the mighty nations of the earth. RESTRAINTS ON THE STATES Framing a government and endowing it with large powers were by no means the sole concern of the convention. Its very existence had been due quite as much to the conduct of the state legislatures as to the futilities of a paralyzed Continental Congress. In every state, explains Marshall in his Life of Washington, there was a party of men who had marked out for themselves a more indulgent course. Viewing with extreme tenderness the case of the debtor, their efforts were unceasingly directed to his relief. To exact a faithful compliance with contracts was, in their opinion, a harsh measure which the people could not bear. They were uniformly in favor of relaxing the administration of justice, 
of affording facilities for the payment of debts, or of suspending their collection and remitting taxes. The legislature under the dominance of these men had enacted paper money laws, enabling debtors to discharge their obligations more easily. The convention put an end to such practices by providing that no state should emit bills of credit or make anything but gold or silver legal tender in the payment of debts. The state legislatures had enacted laws allowing men to pay their debts by turning over to creditors land or personal property. They had repealed the charter of an endowed college and taken the management from the hands of the lawful trustees, and they had otherwise interfered with the enforcement of private agreements. The convention, taking notice of such matters, inserted a clause forbidding states to impair the obligation of contracts. The more venturous of the radicals had in Massachusetts raised the standard of revolt against the authorities of the state. The convention answered by a brief sentence to the effect that the President of the United States, to be equipped with a regular army, would send troops to suppress domestic insurrections whenever called upon by the legislature or, if it was not in session, by the governor of the state, to make sure that the restrictions on the states would not be dead letters, the federal constitution, laws, and treaties were made by the supreme law of the land, to be enforced whenever necessary by a national judiciary and executive against violations on the part of any state authorities. Provisions for Ratification and Amendment when the frame of government had been determined, the powers to be vested in it had been enumerated, and the restrictions upon the states had been written into the bond, there remained three final questions. How shall the Constitution be ratified? What number of states shall be necessary to put it into effect? How shall it be amended in the future? On the first point, the mandate under which the Convention was sitting seemed positive. The Articles of Confederation were still in effect. They provided that amendments could be made only by unanimous adoption in Congress and the approval of all the states. As if to give force to this provision of law, the call for the Convention had expressly stated that all alterations and revisions should be reported to Congress for adoption or rejection, Congress itself to transmit the document thereafter to the states for their review. To have observed the strict letter of the law would have defeated the purposes of the delegates, because Congress and the state legislatures were openly hostile to such drastic changes as had been made. Unanimous ratification, as events proved, would have been impossible. Therefore the delegates decided that the Constitution should be sent to Congress with the recommendation that it, in turn, transmit the document, not to the state legislatures, but to conventions held in the states for the special object of deciding upon ratification. This process was followed. It was their belief that special conventions would be more friendly than the state legislatures. The convention was equally positive in dealing with the problem of the number of states necessary to establish the new constitution. Attempts to change the articles had failed because amendment required the approval of every state, and there was always at least one recalcitrant member of the Union. The opposition to a new constitution was undoubtedly formidable. Rhode Island had even refused to take part in framing it, and her hostility was deep and open. So the convention cast aside the provision of the Articles of Confederation, which required unanimous approval for any changes in the plan of government. It decreed that the new Constitution should go into effect when ratified by nine states. In providing for future changes in the Constitution itself, the Convention also thrust aside the old rule of unanimous approval and decided that an amendment could be made on a two-thirds vote in both houses of Congress and ratification by three-fourths of the states. This change was of profound significance. Every state agreed to be bound in the future by amendments duly adopted, even in case it did not approve them itself. America in this way set out upon the high road that led from a league of states.
Section 3 of History of the United States by Charles Beard and Mary Ritter Beard Part 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer The Struggle Over Ratification on September 17, 1787, the Constitution, having been finally drafted in clear and simple language, a model to all makers of fundamental law, was adopted. The Convention, after nearly four months of debate and secret session, flung open the doors and presented to the Americans the finished plan for the new government. Then the great debate passed to the people. The Opposition Storms of criticism at once descended upon the Constitution. Fraudulent usurpation, exclaimed Gary, who had refused to sign it. A monster, out of the thick veil of secrecy, declaimed a Pennsylvania newspaper. An iron-handed despotism will be the result, protested a third. We, the low-born, sarcastically wrote a fourth, will now admit the six hundred well-born immediately to establish this most noble, most excellent, and truly divine constitution. The president will become a king. Congress will be as tyrannical as parliament in the old days. The states will be swallowed up. The rights of the people will be trampled upon. The poor man's justice will be lost in the endless delays of the federal courts. Such was the strain of the protest against ratification. DEFENSE OF THE CONSTITUTION Moved by the tempest of opposition, Hamilton, Madison, and Jay took up their pens in defense of the Constitution. In a series of newspaper articles they discussed and expounded with eloquence, learning, and dignity every important clause and provision of the proposed plan. These papers, afterwards collected and published in a volume known as The Federalist, form the finest textbook on the Constitution that has ever been printed. It takes its place, moreover, among the wisest and weightiest treatises on government ever written in any language in any time. Other men, not so gifted, were no less earnest in their support of ratification. In private correspondence, editorials, pamphlets, and letters to the newspapers, they urged their countrymen to forget their partisanship and accept a constitution which, in spite of any defects great or small, was the only guarantee against dissolution and warfare at home and dishonor and weakness abroad. The Action of the State Conventions Before the end of the year, 1787, three states had ratified the Constitution. Delaware and New Jersey unanimously in Pennsylvania after a short, though savage, contest. Connecticut and Georgia followed early the next year. Then came the Battle Royale in Massachusetts, ending in ratification in February by the narrow margin of 187 votes to 168. In the spring came the news that Maryland and South Carolina were under the new roof. On June 21st, New Hampshire, where the sentiment was at first strong enough to defeat the Constitution, joined the new republic, influenced by the favorable decision in Massachusetts. Swift couriers were sent to carry the news to New York and Virginia, where the question of ratification was still undecided. Nine states had accepted it and were united, whether more saw fit to join or not. Meanwhile, however, Virginia, after a long and searching debate, had given her approval by a narrow margin, leaving New York as the next seat of anxiety. In that state, the popular vote for the delegates to the convention had been clearly and heavily against ratification. Events finally demonstrated the futility of resistance, and Hamilton, by good judgment and masterly arguments, was at last able to marshal a majority of thirty to thirty-seven votes in favor of ratification. The great contest was over. All the states, except North Carolina and Rhode Island, had ratified. The sloop anarchy, wrote an ebullient journalist, when last heard from, was ashore on Union rocks. The First Election In the autumn of 1788, elections were held to fill the places in the new government. Public opinion was overwhelmingly in favor of Washington as the first president. Yielding to the importunities of friends, he accepted the post in the spirit of public service. 
On April 30th, 1789, he took the oath of office at Federal Hall in New York City. Long live George Washington, President of the United States, cried Chancellor Livingston as soon as the general had kissed the Bible. The cry was caught by the assembled multitude and given back. A new experiment in popular government was launched. References M. Farrand, The Framing of the Constitution of the United States P. L. Ford, Essays on the Constitution of the United States The Federalist, in many editions G. Hunt, Life of James Madison A. C. McLaughlin, The Confederation and the Constitution, American Nation Series Questions 1. Account for the failure of the Articles of Confederation. 2. Explain the domestic difficulties of the individual states. 3. Why did efforts at reform by the Congress come to naught? 4. Narrate the events leading up to the Constitutional Convention. 5. Who were some of the leading men in the Convention? What had been their previous training? 6. State the great problems before the Convention. 7. In what respects were the planting and commercial states opposed? What compromises were reached? 8. Show how the check and balance system is embodied in our form of government. 9. How did the powers conferred upon the Federal Government help cure the defects of the Articles of Confederation? 10. In what way did the provisions for ratifying and amending the Constitution depart from the old system? Section 4 of the History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard, Part 3, The Union and National Politics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rise of Political Parties Dissension over Hamilton's measures. Hamilton's plans, touching deeply as they did the resources of individuals and the interests of the states, awakened alarm and opposition. Funding at face value, said his critics, was a government favor to speculators, and the assumption of state debts was a deep design to undermine the state government. Congress had no constitutional power to create a bank. The law creating the bank merely allowed private corporation to make proper money and lend it at a high rate of interest, and the tariff was a tax on land and labor for the benefit of the manufacturers. Hamilton's reply to this bill of the indictment was simple and straightforward. Some rascally speculators had profited from the funding of the debt at face value, but that was only an incident in the restoration of public credit in the view of the jealousies of the states, it was a good thing to reduce their powers and pretensions. The Constitution was not to be interrupted narrowly, but in the full light of the national needs. The bank would enlarge the amount of capital so sorely needed to start up the American industries, giving markets to farmers and planters. The tariff, by creating a home market and increasing opportunities for employment, would benefit both land and labor. Out of such wise policies firmly pursued by the government, he concluded, were bound to come strength and prosperity for the new government at home, credit, and power abroad. This view Washington fully endorsed, adding the weight of the great name of the inherited merits on the measures adopted under his administration. The sharpness of partisan conflict, as a result of the clash of opinion, the people of the country gradually divided into two parties, 
Federalist and Anti-Federalist, the former led by Hamilton, the later by Jefferson. The strength of the Federalists lay in the cities, Boston, Providence, Hartford, New York, Philadelphia, Charleston, among manufacturing, financial, and commercial groups of the population who were eager to extend their business operations, and the strength of the Anti-Federalists lay mainly among the debt burden farmers who feared growth of what they called a money power and planters in all sections who feared dominance of commercial and manufacturing interest the farming and planting south outside of the few towns finally presented an almost solid front against assumption the bank and the tariff the conflict between the parties grew steadily in bitterness despite the conciliatory engaging manner in which hamilton presented his cause in the state papers, despite the constant effort of Washington to soften the asperity of the contestants. The Leadership and Doctrines of Jefferson The party dispute had not gone far before the opponents of the administration began to look at Jefferson as their leader. Some of Hamilton's measure he had approved, declaring afterwards that he did not at the time understand their significance others particularly the bank he fiercely assailed more than once he and hamilton shaking violently with anger attacked each other at cabinet meetings and nothing short of the grave and dignified pleas of washington prevented an early and open break between them in seventeen ninety four it had finally came Jefferson resigned as Secretary of the State and retired to his home in Virginia to assume, through correspondence and negotiation, the leadership of a steady-growing party of opposition. Shy and modest in manner, halting in speech, disliking the turmoil of public debate, and deeply interested in science and philosophy, Jefferson was not very well fitted for the strenuous life of political contest. Nevertheless, he was an ambitious and shrewd negotiator. He was also, by honest opinion, and matured conviction, the exact opposite of Hamilton. The latter believed in a strong, active, high-toned government, vigorously compelling in all its branches. Jefferson looked at such a government as dangerous to the liberties of citizens and openly avowed his faith in the desirability of the occasional popular uprising. Hamilton distrusted people. Quote, Your people is a great beast, he is reported to have said. Jefferson professed his faith in the people with an abandon that was considered reckless in his time. On economic matters, the opinions of two leaders were also hopelessly at variance. Hamilton, while cherishing agriculture, desired to see America a great commercial and industrial nation. Jefferson was equally set against the course for his country. He had feared that the accumulation of riches and growth in large urban working class, the mobs of great cities, he said, are sores on the body politic. Artisans are usually the dangerous element that make revolutions. Workshops should be kept in Europe, and with them the artisans and their insidious morals and manners. The only substantial foundation for a republic Jefferson believed to be agriculture. The spirit of independence could only be kept alive by free farmers owning land they tilled and looking to the sun and heaven and the labor of their hands for their sustenance. Trusting as he did in the innate goodness of human nature when nourished on a free soil, Jefferson advocated those measures and calculated to favor agriculture to enlarge the rights of the persons rather than the powers of government. Thus he became a champion of the individual against interference of the government, and an ardent advocate of freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom of scientific inquiry. It was, accordingly, no more fictitious of spirit that drove him into opposition to Hamilton. The Whiskey Rebellion the political agitation of the Anti-Federalists was accompanied by an armed revolt against the government in 1794. The occasion for this uprising was another of Hamilton's measures, a law laying an excise tax on distilled spirits, for the purpose of increasing revenue needed to pay the interest of the funded debt. 
It so happened to be a very considerable part of the whiskey manufacture in the country was made by farmers, especially on the frontier, in their own stills. The new revenue law meant that federal officers would now come into the homes of people, measure their liquor, and take the taxes out of their pockets. All the bitterness of the farmers felt against the fiscal measures of the government was redoubled. In the western districts of Pennsylvania, Virginia, and North Carolina, they refused to pay the tax. In Pennsylvania, some of them sacked and burned the houses of the debt collectors, as the revolutionists thirty years before had mobbed against agents of King George, sent over to sell stamps. They were in a far away to nullify the law in the whole districts when Washington called out the troops to suppress, quote, the Whiskey Rebellion. Then the movement collapsed, but it left behind deep-seated resentment which flared up in the election of several aldrich anti-federalist congressmen from the disaffected region. The French Revolution In this exciting period, when all of America was distracted by partisan disputes, a storm broke out in Europe, an epoch-making French Revolution, which not only shook the thrones of the old world, but stirred into its depths a young republic in the new world. The first scene of this dramatic affair occurred in the spring of 1789, a few days after Washington was inaugurated. The King of France, Louis the Sixteenth, driven into bankruptcy by extravagance and costly wars, he was forced to resort to his people for financial help. Accordingly, he called for the first time in more than 150 years a meeting of the national parliaments, the Estates General, composed of representatives of the three estates, the clergy, nobility, and commoners. Acting under powerful leaders as commoner or the third estate, swept aside the clergy and nobility and resolved themselves into national assembly. This stirred the country to its depths. Louis the Sixteenth in the hands of the mob. Great events followed the Swiss succession. On July fourteenth, seventeen eighty nine, the Bastille, an old royal prison, a symbol of the king's absolutism, was stormed by a Paris crowd and destroyed. On the night of August fourth, the feudal privileges of the nobility were abolished by the National Assembly amid great excitement. A few days later came the famous Declaration of the Rights of Man, proclaiming sovereignty of the people and privileges of its citizens. In autumn 1791, Louis XVI was forced to accept a new constitution for France, vesting legislative power in a popular assembly. Little disorder accompanied these startling changes. To all appearances, a peaceful revolution had stripped the French king of his royal prerogatives and based the government of his country in the consent of the governed. American Influence in France In undertaking their great political revolt, the French had been encouraged by the outcome of the American Revolution. Officers and soldiers who had served in the American War reported to their French countrymen of marvelous tales. At the frugal table of General Washington in a council of the unpretentious Franklin, or at the conferences over the strategy of war, French noblemen of the ancient lineage learned to respect both the talents and the simple character of the leaders in the great republican commonwealth beyond the seas. Travelers who had gone to see the experiment in republicanism with their own eyes carried home to the king and ruling class stories of astounding system of popular government. On the other hand, dalliance with American democracy was regarded by the French conservatives as playing with fire. Quote, when we think of false ideas of government and philanthropy, wrote one of Lafayette's aides, which these youth acquired America and propagated in France with so much enthusiasm and such deplorable success, for this mania of intimidation powerfully aided revolution, although it was not the sole cause of it, we are bound to confess that it w would have been better, both for themselves and for us, if these young philosophers in red-heeled shoes would stay at home in attendance on the court. Early American Opinion of the French Revolution 
so close to the ties between the two nations that it is not surprising to find every step in the first stages of the French Revolution greeted with applause in the United States. Quote, Liberty will have another feather in her cap, exuberantly wrote a Boston editor. In no part of the globe, soberly wrote John Marshall, was this revolution hailed with more joy than in America. But one sentiment existed. The main key to Bastille sent Washington as a memento, was accepted as a token of victory gained by liberty, Thomas Paine saw, the great event, the first ripe fruits of the American principle transplanted into Europe. Federalists and Anti-Federalists regarded the new Constitution of France as another vindication of American ideals. The Reign of Terror While profuse congratulations were being exchanged, rumors began to come that all was not well in France. Many noblemen, enraged at the loss of their special privileges, fled into Germany and plotted an invasion of France to overthrow the new system of government. Louis the Sixteenth entered into the negotiations with his brother monarchs, on content to secure their help in the same enterprise, and he finally betrayed the French people his true sentiment by attempting to escape his kingdom, only to be captured and taken back to Paris in disgrace. A new phase of government had now opened. The working people, excluded from all share of government by the first French constitution, became restless, especially in Paris. Assembling the Champs de Mars, a great open field, they signed a petition calling for another constitution, giving them suffrage. When told to disperse, they refused and were fired upon by the National Guard. This massacre, as it was called, enraged the populace. A radical party, known as the Jacobins, then sprang up, taking its name from Jacobin Monastery, in which it held its sessions. A little while it became a master of a popular convention, convoked in September of 1792. The monarch was immediately abolished and the republic established. On January 21, 1793, Louis was sent to the scaffold. To the war in Austria, already raging, was added a war on England. Then came a reign of terror, during which radicals in possession the convention executed in large number counter-revolutionists and the suspected sympathy of those with the monarchy. They shot down peasants who rose in the insurrection against their rule and established a relentless dictatorship. Civil war followed. Terrible atrocities were committed on both sides in the name of liberty and in the name of monarchy. To Americans of the conservative temper, it was now seen that the revolution so auspiciously begun, had degraded into anarchy and mere bloodthirsty strife. Burke summons to the World War on France. In England, Edmund Burke led the fight against the new French principles in which he feared might spread to all of Europe. In his reflections on the French Revolution, written in 1790, he attacked with terrible wrath the whole program of popular government. He called for war, relentless war, upon the French as monsters and outlaws. He demanded that they be reduced to order by the restoration of the king to full power under the protection of the arms of the European nation. Paine's Defense of the French Revolution To counteract the campaign of hate against the French, Thomas Paine replied to Burke in another of the famous tracts, The Rights of Man, which was given to the American public in an edition containing the letter of approval from Jefferson. Burke said Paine had now been mourning about the glories of the French monarchy and aristocracy, but had not forgotten the starving peasants and the oppressed people. He had wept over plumage and neglected the dying Burke. Burke had denied the right of the French people to choose their own governors, blandly forgetting that the English government, in which he saw final protection itself, rested on two revolutions. He had boasted that the King of England held his crown in contempt of the democratic societies. Paine answered, 
If I ask a man in America if he wants a king, he retorts and asks me if I take him for an idiot. To the charge of the doctrines of the rights of man were newfangled, Paine replied that the question was not whether they were new or old, or whether they were right or wrong. As the French disorders and difficulties, he bade the world to wait and see what would be brought forth in due time. The Effect of the French Revolution on American Politics The course of the French Revolution and the controversies accompanying it exercised profound influence on the formation of the first political parties in America. The followers of Hamilton, now proud of the name Federalist, drew back in fright as they heard of the cruel deeds committed during the Reign of Terror. They turned savagely upon the revolutionists and their friends in America, denouncing as Jacobin everybody who did not condemn loudly enough the proceedings of the French Republic, as a Massachusetts preacher roundly assailed that the aesthetical, anarchical, and other respects and moral principles of the French Republicans, he then proceeded with equal passion to attack Jefferson and the other Anti-Federalists, whom he charged with spreading false French propaganda and portraying America. The editors, patrons, and abettors of these vehicles of slander, he exclaimed, ought to be considered and treated as enemies of their country, of all traitors who are most aggravately criminal, of all villains, they are most infamous and detestable. The Anti-Federalists, as a matter of fact, were generally favorable to the Revolution, although they deplored many of the events associated with it. Paine's pamphlet, endorsed by Jefferson, was widely read. Democratic societies, after the fashion of French political clubs, arose in the cities. The coalition of European monarchs against France was denounced as a coalition against the very principles of republicanism, and the execution of Louis the Sixteenth was openly celebrated at the banquet in Philadelphia. Harmless titles, such as Sir and the Honorable and His Excellency, were decried as aristocratic, and some of the more excited insisted on adopting the French title citizen, speaking, for example, citizen judge, citizen toastmaster. Pamphlets were in defense of the French, streamed from the press, while subsidized newspapers kept propaganda in full swing. The European War Disturbs the American Commerce This battle of wits, or rather the contest and colony, might have gone on indefinitely in America without producing any serious result had it not been for the war between England and France then raging. The English, having command of the seas, claimed the right to seize American produce bound for French ports and to confiscate American ships that carry French goods. Adding fuel to the fire already hot enough, they began to search for American ships and to carry off British foreign sailors they found on American vessels. The French Appeal for Help At the same time, the French Republican turned to the United States for aid in its war, and England sent over its diplomatic representative, Citizen Ghent, an ardent supporter of the new order. On his arrival at Charleston, he was greeted with fervor by the Anti-Federalists, and made his way north. He was wined and dined and given popular ovations that turned his head. He thought the whole country was ready to join the French Revolution in his contest with England. Gannett therefore attempted to use American ports as a base of operations for French privateers preying on British merchant ships. He insisted that the United States was in honor bound to help France under the treaty of 1778. The Proclamation of Neutrality and the Jay Treaty Unmoved by the rising tide of popular sympathy for France, Washington took a firm course. He received Ghent coldly. The demand that the United States aid France under the old Treaty of Alliance, he answered by proclaiming the neutrality of America and warning American citizens against hostile acts towards either France or England. When Gannett continued to hold meetings and issue manifestos, the stir between people against England and Washington asked the French government 
to recall him. This act followed by the sending of Chief Justice John Jay on a Pacific mission to England. The result was celebrated Jay Treaty of 1794. By its terms, the Great Britain agreed to withdraw her troops from the Russian forts where they had been since the war for independence and grant certain slight of trade concessions. The chief sources of bitterness the failure of British to return slaves carried off during the revolution, the seizure of American ships, the impressment of sailors, were not touched. Much of the distress of everybody in America, including loyal Federalists. Nevertheless, Washington dreaded the armed conflict which England urged the Senate to ratify the treaty. The weight of his influence carried the day. At this, the hostility of the Anti-Federalists knew no bounds. Jefferson declared that the Jay Treaty, quote, an infamous act which is really nothing more than an alliance between England and the Anglo men of this country against the legislature of the people of the United States. Hamilton, defending it in his usual courage, was stoned by a mob in New York and driven from the platform with blood streaming from his face. Jay burned in effigy. Even Washington was not spared. The House of Representatives was hopelessly hostile. To display the feelings, it called upon the President for papers relative to the treaty negotiations, only to be more highly incensed by the flat refusal to present them, on the ground that the House did not share in the same treaty-making power. Washington retires from politics. Such angry contests confirmed the president in slowly maturing determination to retire at the end of his second term in office. He did not believe that a third term was unconstitutional or improper, but worn by the long and arduous labors in war and in peace, and wounded by harsh attacks from former friends, he longed for the quiet of his beautiful estate at Mount Vernon. In September of 1796, on the eve of the presidential election, Washington issued his farewell address, another state paper to be treasured and read by generations of Americans to come. In this address, he directed the attention of the people to three subjects of lasting interest. He warned them against sectional jealousies. He remonstrated against the spirit of partisanship, saying that in government, quote, of popular character, in government purely elective, it is in the spirit not to be encouraged. He likewise cautioned people against, quote, the insidious wails of foreign influence, saying that your pesset of primary interests, which to us have none or very remote relation, hence she must be engaged in frequent controversies, the causes of which are essentially foreign to our concerns, hence, therefore, it would be unwise for us to implicate ourselves by artificial ties in ordinary vicissitudes of her politics or ordinary combinations and collisions of her friendships or in enemies. Why forego the advantages of such a peculiar situation? It is our true policy to steer clear of the permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world, taking care to keep ourselves by suitable establishments on a respectable and defensive posture we may safely trust to temporary alliances for an extraordinary emergencies. The Campaign of 1796 Adams elected On hearing of the retirement of Washington, the Anti-Federalist cast off all restraints. In the honor of France and the opposition to what they were pleased to call the monarchical tendencies of the Federalists, they boldly assumed that the name Republican, the term Democrat, then applied to only to obscure and despised radicals that had not come into general use. They selected Jefferson as a candidate for president against John Adams, and the Federalist nominee carried the spirited campaign that came with four votes of electing him. The successful candidate, Adams, was not fitted by training or opinion on conciliating determined opposition. He was reserved for the studious man, he was neither a good speaker nor a skillful negotiator. In one of his books, he had declared himself in favor of a, quote, government by an aristocracy of talents and wealth, an offense which Republicans never forgave, while John Marshall found him a sensible, plain, candid, 
and good-tempered man jefferson could see in him nothing but a monocrat and an angloman it had not been for the conduct of the french government adams would hardly have enjoyed a moment of genuine popularity during his administration the quarrel with france the french directory of the executive department established under the constitution of seventeen ninety five managed however to stir anger of republicans and federalists alike in the regard to the jay treaty and the rebuke of france the flagrant violation of the obligation solemnly registered in the treaty of seventeen seventy eight accordingly it refused to receive american minister treated him in a humiliating way and finally told him to leave the country overlooking this affront in the anxiety to maintain peace adams dispatched to france a commission of eminent men with instructions to reach the understanding with the french republic on their arrival they were charged to find instead of a decent reception an indirect demand for apology respecting the past conduct of the american government a payment in cash and an annual tribute as the price of their continued friendship with the news of this affair reached president adams he promptly laid it before congress referring to the frenchman who had made the demands as mr x mr y and mr z this insult coupled with the fact that the french privateers like the british were preying on american commerce enraged even the republicans who had the loudest in the profession of their french sympathies they forgot their wrath over the jay treaty and joined with the federalists in shouting millions for defense not a cent for tribute preparations for war were made in every hand washington was once more called from mount vernon to take his old position at the head of the army indeed fighting actually began on the high seas and went on without formal declaration of war until the year eighteen hundred by that time the directory had been overthrown a treaty was readily made with napoleon the first consul who was beginning his remarkable career as the chief of the french republic soon to be turned into an empire alien and sedition laws flourish with success the federalists determined if possible to put an end to the radical french influence in america and to silence the republican opposition they therefore passed two drastic laws in the summer of seventeen ninety eight the alien and sedition acts the first of these measures empowered president to expel from the country or to imprison any alien whom he regarded as dangerous or had reasonable grounds to suspect of any treasonable or secret machinations against the government the second of measures the sedition act penalized not only those who attempted to stir up unlawful combinations against the government but also every one who wrote uttered or published quote, any false scandalous or malicious writing against the government of the united states or either the house of congress or the president of the united states with intent to defame said government or to bring them or either of them into contempt or disrepute this measure was hurried through congress in spite of the opposition and clear provision in the constitution that congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press even many federalists feared that the consequences of the action hamilton was alarmed when he read the bill exclaiming let us not establish a tyranny energy is very different from thing from violence john marshall told his friends in virginia that he had been in congress that he would have opposed two bills because he thought them useless calculated to create unnecessary discontents and jealousies the alien law was not enforced but was given great offence to the irish and french whose activities against the american government's policy respecting great britain to put in the danger of prison the sedation law on the other hand was vigorously applied several editors of the republican newspapers soon found themselves in jail or broken by ruinous fines for their catastic criticism of the federalist president and his policies bystanders at political meetings who uttered sentiments which 
through ungenerous and severe seeming harmless enough now were hurried before a federalist judge and promptly fined and imprisoned although the prosecutions were not numerous they aroused a keen resentment the republicans were convinced that their political opponents having saddled upon the country's and hamilton's fiscal system and the british treaty were bent on silencing all censure the measure therefore had exactly the opposite effect on which their authorities intended instead of helping the federalist party they made criticism of once more bitter than ever the kentucky and virginia revolutions jefferson was quick to take advantage of the discontent he drafted a set of revolutions declaring the sedition law null and void violating the federal constitution his resolutions were passed by the kentucky legislature late in seventeen ninety eight signed by the governor and transmitted to other states for their consideration though receiving unfavorable replies for a number of northern states kentucky followed year reaffirmed its position and declared that the nullification of all unconstitutional acts of congress was the right remedy to be used by the states in the readiness of grievances it was thus defied the american government and announced a doctrine hostile to nationality and fraught with a terrible meaning for the future in the neighboring state of virginia madison led a movement against the alien and sedition laws he induced legislature to pass resolutions condemning the acts as unconstitutional and calling upon the other states to take proper measures to preserve their rights and the rights of the people the republican triumph in the eighteen hundred thus the way was prepared for the election of eighteen hundred the republican left no stone unturned in their efforts to place the federalist candidate president adams all the odium of the alien and sedition laws in addition to the responsibility for approving hamilton's measures and policies the federalists divided in councils and cold in their affection for adams made poor campaign they tried to discredit their opponents with epithets of jacobians and the anarchists in terms to be weakened by excessive use when the vote was counted it was found that adams had been defeated while the republicans had carried the entire south and new york also secured eight of the fifteen electoral votes cast by pennsylvania quote, our beloved adams will now close his bright career lamented a federalist newspaper sons of faction demagogues high priest of anarchy now you have cause to triumph a quarrel between federalists and republican in the house of representatives jefferson's election however was still uncertain by a curious provision of the constitution presidential electors were required to vote for two persons without indicating which office was each to fill one was receiving the highest number of votes to be the president and candidate standing next to be vice president it so happened that aaron burr the republican candidate for vice president had received the same number of votes as jefferson and neither a majority of the election was thrown into the house of representatives while the federalists held the balance of power although it was well known that burr was not even a candidate for president his friends and many of the federalists began intriguing his election to the high office had it not been for the vigorous action of hamilton the prize might have been snatched out of jefferson's hand not until thirty sixth ballot on february seventeenth eighteen o one was the great issue decided in his favor references g s bassett the federalist system american national series c a beard economic origins of the jeffersonian democracy h lodge alexander hamilton j t morse thomas jefferson questions who were the leaders of the first administration under the constitution two what step was taken to appease the opposition three enumerate hamilton's great measures to explain in each detail four show the connection between the parts of hamilton's system five contrast the general political views of hamilton and jefferson six 
what were the important results of the peaceful French Revolution, 1789-92? to 92? 7. Explain the interaction of the opinion between France and the United States. 8. How did the reign of terror change American opinion? 9. What was the Burke Payne controversy? 10. Show how the war in Europe affected American commerce and involved America with England and France. 11. What were American policies with regard to each of those countries? 12. What was the outcome of the Alien and Sedition Acts? Research Topics Early Federal Legislation Command Industrial History of the United States Page 133 to 156 Elson History of the United States Page 341 to 348 Hamilton Report on Public Credit MacDonald Documentary Source Book Page 233 to 243 the French Revolution, Robinson and Beard, Development of Modern Europe, Volume 1, pages 224-282, Elson, page 351-354. to The burke Payne Controversy, Make an Analysis of Burke's Reflection on the French Revolution and Payne Rights of Man, Alien and Sedition Act, MacDonald, Documentary Sourcebook, Page 259 to 267. Elson, pages 367 to 375. Kentucky and Virginian Resolutions. MacDonald, page 267 to 278. Source Studies, Materials and Heart, American History Told by Contemporaries, Volume 3, pages 255 to 343. Biographical Studies Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and Albert Gallington. The Twelfth Amendment contrasts the provision in original Constitution with terms of the amendment. See Appendix. Footnotes 1. North Carolina ratified November 1789 and Rhode Island in May of 1790. 2. To prevent repetition of such an unfortunate affair, the Twelfth Amendment of the Constitution was adopted in 1804, changing slightly the method of electing the President. End of Section 4section eight b of the history of the united states by charles a beard and mary ritter beard part three the union and national politics this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by christy nowak the history of the united states by charles a beard and mary ritter beard part three Section 8b Clash of Political Parties Foreign Influences and Domestic Politics The French Revolution In this exciting period, when all America was distracted by partisan disputes, a storm broke in Europe. The epoch-making French Revolution, which not only shook the thrones of the Old World, but stirred to its depths the young republic of the New World. The first scene in this dramatic affair occurred in the spring of 1789, a few days after Washington was inaugurated. The King of France, Louis the Sixteenth, driven into bankruptcy by extravagance and costly wars, was forced to resort to his people for financial help. Accordingly, he called, for the first time in more than 150 years, a meeting of the National Parliament, the Estates General, composed of representatives of the three estates, the clergy nobility and commoners acting under powerful leaders the commoners or third estate 
swept aside the clergy and nobility and resolved themselves into a national assembly. This stirred the country to its depths. Great events followed in swift succession. On July 14, 1789, the Bastille, an old royal prison, symbol of the king's absolutism, was stormed by a Paris crowd and destroyed. On the night of August 4th, the feudal privileges of the nobility were abolished by the National Assembly amid great excitement. A few days later came the famous Declaration of the Rights of Man, proclaiming the sovereignty of the people and the privileges of citizens. In the autumn of 1791, Louis the Sixteenth was forced to accept a new constitution for France, vesting the legislative power in a popular assembly. Little disorder accompanied these startling changes. To all appearances, a peaceful revolution had stripped the French king of his royal prerogatives and based the government of his country on the consent of the governed. American Influence in France in undertaking their great political revolt, the French had been encouraged by the outcome of the American Revolution. Officers and soldiers who had served in the American War reported to their French countrymen marvelous tales. At the frugal table of General Washington, in council with the unpretentious Franklin, or at conferences over the strategy of war, French noblemen of ancient lineage learned to respect both the talents and the simple character of the leaders in the great Republican Commonwealth beyond the seas travelers who had gone to see the experiment in republicanism with their own eyes carried home to the king and ruling class stories of an astounding system of popular government on the other hand the dalliance with american democracy was regarded by french conservatives as playing with fire when we think of the false ideas of government and philanthropy wrote one of lafayette's aides which these youths acquired in America and propagated in France with so much enthusiasm and deplorable success, for this mania of imitation powerfully aided by the revolution, though it was not the sole cause of it, we are bound to confess that it would have been better, both for themselves and for us, if these young philosophers in red-heeled shoes had stayed at home in attendance on the court. Early American Opinion of the French Revolution so close were the ties between the two nations that it is not surprising to find every step in the first stages of the French Revolution greeted with applause in the United States. Liberty will have another feather in her cap, exultantly wrote a Boston editor. In no part of the globe, soberly wrote John Marshall, was this revolution hailed with more joy than in America. But one sentiment existed. The main key to the Bastille, sent to Washington as a memento, was accepted as a token of the victory gained by liberty. Thomas Paine saw in the great event the first ripe fruits of American principles transplanted into Europe. Federalists and Anti-Federalists regarded the new Constitution of France as another vindication of American ideals. The Reign of Terror While profuse congratulations were being exchanged, Rumors began to come that all was not well in France. Many noblemen, enraged at the loss of their special privileges, fled into Germany and plotted an invasion of France to overthrow the new system of government. Louis the Sixteenth entered into negotiations with his brother monarchs on the continent to secure their help in the same enterprise, and he finally betrayed to the French people his true sentiments by attempting to escape from his kingdom, only to be captured and taken back to Paris in disgrace. A new phase of the revolution now opened. The working people, excluded from all share in the government by the first French constitution, became restless, especially in Paris. Assembling on Champs de Mars, a great open field, they signed a petition calling for another constitution giving them the suffrage. When told to disperse, they refused and were fired upon by the National Guard. This massacre, as it was called, enraged the populace. A radical party, known as the Jacobins, then sprang up, taking its name from a Jacobin monastery in which it held its sessions. In a little while it became the master of the popular convention convoked in September 1792. The monarchy was immediately abolished, and a republic was established. On January 21st, 1793, Louis was sent to the scaffold. To the war on Austria, already raging, was added a war on England. Then came the reign of terror, during which radicals in possession of the convention executed a large number of counter-revolutionists and those suspected of sympathy with the monarchy. They shot down peasants who rose in insurrection against their rule and established a relentless dictatorship. Civil war followed. Terrible atrocities were committed on both sides in the name of liberty and in the name of monarchy. 
To Americans of conservative temper, it now seemed that the revolution, so auspiciously begun, had degenerated into anarchy and mere bloodthirsty strife. Burke summons the world to war on France. In England, Edmund Burke led the fight against the new French principles which he feared might spread to all Europe. In his Reflections on the French Revolution, written in 1790, he attacked with terrible wrath the whole program of popular government. He called for war, relentless war, upon the French as monsters and outlaws. He demanded that they be reduced to order by the restoration of the king to the full power under the protection of the arms of European nations. Paine's Defense of the French Revolution to counteract the campaign of hate against the French, Thomas Paine replied to Burke in another of his famous tracts, The Rights of Man, which was given to the American public in an edition containing a letter of approval from Jefferson. Burke, said Paine, had been mourning about the glories of the French monarchy and aristocracy, but had forgotten the starving peasants and oppressed people, had wept over the plumage, and neglected the dying bird. Burke had denied the right of the French people to choose their own governors, blandly forgetting that the English government in which he saw final perfection itself rested on two revolutions. He had boasted that the King of England held his crown in contempt of democratic societies. Paine answered, If I ask a man in America if he wants a king, he retorts and asks me if I take him for an idiot. To the charge that the doctrines of the rights of man were newfangled, Paine replied that the question was not whether they were new or old, but whether they were right or wrong. As to the French disorders and difficulties, he bade the world wait to see what would be brought forth in due time. The Effect of the French Revolution on American Politics The course of the French Revolution, and the controversies accompanying it, exercised a profound influence on the formation of the first political parties in America. The followers of Hamilton, now proud of the name Federalists, drew back in fright as they heard of the cruel deeds committed during the Reign of Terror. They turned savagely upon the revolutionists and their friends in America, denouncing as Jacobin everybody who did not condemn loudly enough the proceedings of the French Republic. A Massachusetts preacher roundly assailed the atheistical, anarchical, and in other respects immoral principles of the French Republicans. He then proceeded with equal passion to attack Jefferson and the Anti-Federalists, whom he charged with spreading false French propaganda and betraying America. "'The editors, patrons, and abettors of these vehicles of slander,' he exclaimed, "'ought to be considered and treated as enemies to their country. Of all traitors they are the most aggravatedly criminal. Of all villains they are the most infamous and detestable.'" The Anti-Federalists, as a matter of fact, were generally favorable to the Revolution, although they deplored many of the events associated with it. Paine's pamphlet, endorsed by Jefferson, was widely read. Democratic societies, after the fashion of French political clubs, arose in the cities. The coalition of European monarchs against France was denounced as a coalition against the very principles of republicanism, and the execution of Louis the Sixteenth was openly celebrated at a banquet in Philadelphia. Harmless titles, such as Sir, the Honorable, and His Excellency, were decried as aristocratic, and some of the more excited insisted on adopting the French title Citizen, speaking, for example, of Citizen Judge and Citizen Toastmaster. Pamphlets in defense of the French streamed from the press, while subsidized newspapers kept the propaganda in full swing. The European War Disturbs American Commerce this battle of wits, or rather contest in calumny, might have gone on indefinitely in America without producing any serious results, had it not been for the war between England and France, then raging. The English claimed the right to seize American produce bound for French ports and to confiscate American ships engaged in carrying French goods. Adding fuel to a fire not already hot enough, they began to search American ships and to carry off British-born sailors found on board American vessels. The French appeal for help. At the same time, the French Republic turned to the United States for aid in its war on England, and sent over as its diplomatic representative, Citizen Genet, an ardent supporter of the new order. On his arrival at Charleston, he was greeted with fervor by the Anti-Federalists. As he made his way north, he was wined and dined and given popular ovations that turned his head. 
he thought the whole country was ready to join the French Republic in its contest with England. Genet, therefore, attempted to use the American ports as the base of operations for French privateers preying on British merchant ships, and he insisted that the United States was, in honor, bound to help France under the Treaty of 1778. The Proclamation of Neutrality and the Jay Treaty Unmoved by the rising tide of popular sympathy for France, Washington took a firm course. He received Genet coldly. The demand that the United States aid France under the old Treaty of Alliance he answered by proclaiming the neutrality of America and warning American citizens against hostile acts toward either France or England. When Genet continued to hold meetings, issue manifestos, and stir up the people against England, Washington asked the French government to recall him. This act he followed up by sending the Chief Justice, John Jay, on a Pacific mission to England. The result was the celebrated Jay Treaty of 1794. By its terms, Great Britain agreed to withdraw her troops from the western forts where they had been since the War for Independence, and to grant certain slight trade concessions. The chief sources of bitterness, the failure of the British to return slaves carried off during the Revolution, the seizure of American ships, and the imprisonment of sailors, were not touched much to the distress of everybody in America, including loyal Federalists. Nevertheless, Washington, dreading an armed conflict with England, urged the Senate to ratify the treaty. The weight of his influence carried the day. At this, the hostility of the Anti-Federalists knew no bounds. Jefferson declared the Jay Treaty an infamous act which is really nothing more than an alliance between England and the Anglo-men of this country against the legislature and the people of the United States. Hamilton, defending it with his usual courage, was stoned by a mob in New York and driven from the platform with blood streaming from his face. Jay was burned in effigy. Even Washington was not spared. The House of Representatives was openly hostile. To display its feelings, it called upon the President for the papers relative to the treaty negotiations, only to be more highly incensed by his flat refusal to present them on the ground that the House did not share in the treaty-making power. Washington retires from politics. Such angry contests confirmed the President in his slowly maturing determination to retire at the end of his second term in office. He did not believe that a third term was unconstitutional or improper, but, worn out by his long and arduous labors in war and in peace, and wounded by harsh attacks from former friends, he longed for the quiet of his beautiful estate at Mount Vernon. In September 1796, on the eve of the presidential election, Washington issued his farewell address, another state paper to be treasured and read by generations of Americans to come. In this address, he directed the attention of the people to three subjects of lasting interest. He warned them against sectional jealousies. He remonstrated against the spirit of partisanship, saying that in government of the popular character, in government purely elective, it is a spirit not to be encouraged. He likewise cautioned the people against the insidious wiles of foreign influence, saying, Europe has a set of primary interests which to us have none or very remote relation. Hence, she must be engaged in frequent controversies, the causes of which are essentially foreign to our concerns. Hence, therefore, it would be unwise in us to implicate ourselves by artificial ties in the ordinary vicissitudes of her politics, or the ordinary combinations and collusions of her friendships or enmities. Why forego the advantages of so peculiar a situation? It is our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world, taking care always to keep ourselves, by suitable establishments, on a respectable defensive posture. We may safely trust to temporary alliances for extraordinary emergencies. The Campaign of 1796. Adams Elected. On hearing of the retirement of Washington, the Anti-Federalists cast off all restraints. In honor of France, and in opposition to what they were pleased to call the monarchical tendencies of the Federalists, they boldly assumed the name Republican. The term Democrat, then applied only to obscure and despised radicals, had not come into general use. They selected Jefferson as their candidate for president against John Adams, the Federalist nominee, and carried on such a spirited campaign that they came within four votes of electing him. The successful candidate, Adams, was not fitted by training or opinion for conciliating a determined opposition. He was a reserved and studious man. He was neither a good speaker nor a skillful negotiator. In one of his books, he had declared himself in favor of government by an aristocracy of talents and wealth, an offense which the Republicans never forgave. 
while john marshall found him a sensible plain candid good-tempered man jefferson could see in him nothing but a monocrat and anglo-man had it not been for the conduct of the french government adams would hardly have enjoyed a moment's genuine popularity during his administration the quarrel with france the french directory an executive department established under the constitution of seventeen ninety five managed however to stir the anger of republicans and federalists alike it regarded the jay treaty as a rebuke to france and a flagrant violation of obligations solemnly registered in the treaty of seventeen seventy eight accordingly it refused to receive an american minister treated him in a humiliating way and finally told him to leave the country overlooking this affront in his anxiety to maintain peace adams dispatched to france a commission of eminent men with instructions to reach an understanding with the french republic on their arrival they were chagrined to find instead of a decent reception an indirect demand for an apology respecting the past conduct of the american government a payment in cash and an annual tribute as the price of continued friendship when the news of this affair reached president adams he promptly laid it before congress referring to the frenchman who had made the demands as mr x mr y and mr z this insult coupled with the fact that french privateers like the british were preying upon american commerce enraged even the republicans who had been loudest in the profession of their french sympathies they forgot their wrath over the jay treaty and joined with the federalists in shouting millions for defense not a cent for tribute preparations for war were made on every hand washington was once more called from mount vernon to take his old position at the head of the army indeed fighting actually began upon the high seas and went on without a formal declaration of war until the year eighteen hundred by that time the directory had been overthrown a treaty was readily made with napoleon the first consul who was beginning his remarkable career as chief of the french republic soon to be turned into an empire alien and sedition laws flushed with success the federalists determined if possible to put an end to radical french influence in america and to silence republican opposition they therefore passed two drastic laws in the summer of seventeen ninety eight the alien and sedition acts the first of these measures empowered the president to expel from the country or to imprison any alien whom he regarded as dangerous or had reasonable grounds to suspect of any treasonable or secret machinations against the government the second of the measures the sedition act penalized not only those who attempted to stir up unlawful combinations against the government but also every one who wrote uttered or published any false scandalous and malicious writing against the government of the united states or either house of congress or the president of the united states with the intent to defame said government or to bring them or either of them into contempt or disrepute this measure was hurried through congress in spite of the opposition and the clear provision in the constitution that congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press even many federalists feared the consequences of this action hamilton was alarmed when he read the bill exclaiming let us not establish a tyranny energy is a very different thing from violence john marshall told his friends in virginia that had he been in congress he would have opposed the two bills because he thought them useless and calculated to create unnecessary discontents and jealousies the alien law was not enforced but it gave great offense to the irish and french whose activities against the american government's policy respecting great britain put them in danger of prison the sedition law on the other hand was vigorously applied several editors of republican newspapers soon found themselves in jail or broken by ruinous fines for their caustic criticisms of the federalist president and his policies bystanders at political meetings who uttered sentiments which though ungenerous and severe seemed harmless enough now were hurried before federalist judges and promptly fined and imprisoned although the prosecutions were not numerous they aroused a keen resentment the republicans were convinced that their political opponents having saddled upon the country hamilton's fiscal system and the british treaty were bent on silencing all censure the measures therefore had exactly the opposite effect from that which their authors intended instead of helping the federalist party they made criticism of it more bitter than ever the kentucky and virginia resolutions jefferson was quick to take advantage of the discontent he drafted a set of resolutions declaring the sedition law null and void as violating the federal constitution his resolutions were passed by the kentucky legislature late in seventeen ninety eight signed by the governor and transmitted to the other states for their consideration 
Though receiving unfavorable replies from a number of northern states, Kentucky the following year reaffirmed its position and declared that the nullification of all unconstitutional acts of Congress was the rightful remedy to be used by the states in the redress of grievances. It thus defied the federal government and announced a doctrine hostile to nationality and fraught with terrible meaning for the future. In the neighboring state of Virginia, Madison led a movement against the alien and sedition laws. He induced the legislature to pass resolutions condemning the acts as unconstitutional and calling upon the other states to take proper means to preserve their rights and the rights of the people. The Republican Triumph in 1800 Thus was the way prepared for the election of 1800. The Republicans left no stone unturned in their efforts to place on the Federalist candidate, President Adams, the odium of the alien and sedition laws, in addition to responsibility for approving Hamilton's measures and policies. The Federalists, divided in councils and cold in their affection for Adams, made a poor campaign. They tried to discredit their opponents with epithets of Jacobins and anarchists, terms which had been weakened by excessive use. When the vote was counted, it was found that Adams had been defeated, while the Republicans had carried the entire South and New York also, and secured eight of the fifteen electoral votes cast by Pennsylvania. "'Our beloved Adams will now close his bright career,' lamented a Federalist newspaper. "'Sons of faction, demagogues, and high priests of anarchy, now you have cause to triumph.' Jefferson's election, however, was still uncertain. By a curious provision in the Constitution— presidential electors were required to vote for two persons without indicating which office each was to fill the one receiving the highest number of votes to be president and the candidate standing next to be vice president it so happened that aaron burr the republican candidate for vice president had received the same number of votes as jefferson as neither had a majority the election was thrown into the house of representatives where the federalists held the balance of power Although it was well known that Burr was not even a candidate for president, his friends and many Federalists began intriguing for his election to that high office. Had it not been for the vigorous action of Hamilton, the prize might have been snatched out of Jefferson's hands. Not until the thirty. Section number six, the history of the U.S., part three, the Union and national politics. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Scott History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard Part 3 Section 6 Chapter 9 The Jeffersonian Republicans in Power Republican Principles and Policies Opposition to strong central government, cherishing especially the agricultural interest. As Jefferson said, the Republicans were in the beginning provincial in their concern and outlook. Their attachment to America was, certainly, as strong as that of Hamilton, but they regarded the state rather than the national government, as the proper center of power and affection. Indeed, a large part of the rank and file had been among the opponents of the Constitution in the days of its adoption. Jefferson had entertained doubts about it, and Monroe, destined to be the fifth president, had been one of the bitter foes of ratification. The former went so far in the direction of local autonomy that he exalted the state above the nation in the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798. Declaring the Constitution to be a mere compact and the states 
competent to interpret and nullify federal law. This was provincialism with a vengeance. Quote, it is jealousy, not confidence, which prescribes limited constitutions. End quote, wrote Jefferson for the Kentucky legislature. Jealousy of the national government, not confidence in it. This is the ideal that reflected the provincial and agricultural interest. Republican Simplicity Every act of the Jeffersonian party during its early days of power was in accord with the ideals of government which it professed. It had opposed all pomp and ceremony calculated to give weight and dignity to the chief executive of the nation as symbols of monarchy and high prerogative. Appropriately, therefore, Jefferson's inauguration on March 4, 1801, the first at the new capital at Washington, was marked by extreme simplicity. In keeping with this procedure, he quit the practice, followed by Washington and Adams, of reading presidential addresses to Congress in joint assembly, and adopted in its stead the plan of sending his messages in writing, a custom that was continued unbroken until 1913, when President Wilson returned to the example set by the first chief magistrate. Republican Measures the Republicans had complained of a great national debt as the source of a dangerous, quote, money power, giving strength to the federal government. Accordingly, they began to pay it off as rapidly as possible. They had held commerce in low esteem and looked upon a large navy as a mere device to protect it. Consequently, they reduced the number of warships. They had objected to the excise taxes, particularly on whiskey. These they quickly abolished, to the intense satisfaction of the farmers. They had protested against the heavy cost of the federal government. They reduced expenses by discharging hundreds of men from the army and abolishing many offices. They had savagely criticized the sedition law, and Jefferson refused to enforce it. They had been deeply offended by the assault on freedom of speech and press, and they promptly impeached Samuel Chase, a justice of the Supreme Court, who had been especially severe in his attacks upon offenders under the Sedition Act. Their failure to convict Justice Chase by a narrow margin was due to no lack of zeal on their part, but to the Federalist strength in the Senate where the trial was held. They had regarded the appointment of a large number of federal judges during the last hours of Adams's administration as an attempt to entrench Federalists in the judiciary and to enlarge the sphere of the national government. Accordingly, they at once repealed the act, creating the new judgeships, thus depriving the Quote, midnight appointees of their posts. They had considered the federal offices, civil and military, as sources of great strength to the Federalists, and Jefferson, though committed to the principle that offices should be open to all and distributed according to merit, was careful to fill most of the vacancies as they occurred with trusted Republicans. To his credit, however, it must be said 
that he did not make wholesale removals to find room for party workers. The Republicans, thus hewed to the line of their general policy of restricting the weight, dignity, and activity of the national government, yet there were no Republicans, as the Federalists asserted, prepared to urge serious modifications in the Constitution. Quote, if there be any among us who wish to dissolve this Union or to change its Republican form, end quote, wrote Jefferson in his first inaugural, quote, let them stand undisturbed as monuments of the safety with which error of opinion may be tolerated where reason is left free to combat it. End quote. After reciting the fortunate circumstances of climate, soil, and isolation, which made the future of America so full of promise, Jefferson concluded, quote, A wise and frugal government which shall restrain men from injuring one another shall leave them otherwise free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement, and shall not take from the mouth of labor the bread it has earned. This is the sum of good government, and this is necessary to close the circle of our felicities. End quote. In all this, the Republicans had not reckoned with destiny. In a few short years, that lay ahead, it was their fate to double the territory of the country, making inevitable a continental nation, to give the Constitution a generous interpretation that shocked many Federalists, to wage war on behalf of American commerce, to re-establish the hated United States Bank, to enact a high protective tariff, to see their Federalist opponents in their turn discredited as nullifiers and provincials, to announce high national doctrines in foreign affairs, and to behold the Constitution exalted and defended against the pretensions of states by a son of old Virginia. John Marshall, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. The Republicans and the Great West Expansion and Land Hunger The first of the great measures which drove the Republicans out upon this new national course, the purchase of the Louisiana Territory, was the product of circumstances rather than of their deliberate choosing. It was not the lack of land for his cherished farmers that led Jefferson to add such an immense domain to the original possessions of the United States. In the Northwest Territory, now embracing Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and a portion of Minnesota, settlements were mainly confined to the north bank of the Ohio River. To the south, in Kentucky and Tennessee, where there were more than 100,000 white people who had pushed over the mountains from Virginia and the Carolinas, there were still wide reaches of untilled soil. The Alabama and Mississippi regions were vast Indian frontiers of the state of Georgia, unsettled and almost unexplored. Even to the wildest imagination there seemed to be territory enough to satisfy the land hunger of the American people for a century to come. The Significance of the Mississippi River 
at all events, the East, then the center of power, saw no good reason for expansion. The planters of the Carolinas, the manufacturers of Pennsylvania, the importers of New York, the shipbuilders of New England, looking to the seaboard and to Europe for trade, refinements, and sometimes their ideas of government, were slow to appreciate the place of the West in national economy. The better educated the Easterners were, the less, it seems, they comprehended the destiny of the nation. Sons of Federalist fathers at Williams College, after a long debate, decided by a vote of fifteen to one that the purchase of Louisiana was undesirable. On the other hand, the pioneers of Kentucky, Ohio, and Tennessee, unlearned in books, saw with their own eyes the resources of the wilderness. Many of them had been across the Mississippi and had beheld the rich lands awaiting the plow of the white man. Down the great river they floated their wheat, corn, and bacon to ocean-going ships bound for the ports of the seaboard or for Europe. The land journeys over the mountain barriers with bulky farm produce they knew from experience were almost impossible, and costly at best. Nails, bolts of cloth, tea, and coffee could go or come that way, but not corn and bacon. A free outlet to the sea by the Mississippi was as essential to the pioneers of the Kentucky region as the harbor of Boston to the merchant princes of that metropolis. Louisiana under Spanish rule. For this reason, they watched with deep solicitude the fortunes of the Spanish king, to whom, at the close of the Seven Years' War, had fallen the Louisiana territory stretching from New Orleans to the Rocky Mountains. While he controlled the mouth of the Mississippi, there was little to fear, for he had neither the army nor the navy necessary to resist any invasion of American trade. Moreover, Washington had been able, by the exercise of great tact, to secure from Spain in 1795 a trading privilege through New Orleans which satisfied the present requirements of the frontiersmen, even if it did not allay their fears for the future. So things stood when a swift succession of events altered the whole situation. Louisiana transferred to France. In July 1802, a royal order from Spain instructed the officials at New Orleans to close the port to American produce. About the same time, a disturbing rumor, long current, was confirmed. Napoleon had coerced Spain into returning Louisiana to France by a secret treaty signed in 1800. Quote, the scalers of the Alps and conquerors of Venice, end quote, now looked across the sea for new scenes of adventure. The West was ablaze with excitement. A call for war ran through the frontier. Expeditions were organized to prevent the landing of the French, and petitions for instant action flooded in upon Jefferson. Jefferson sees the danger. Jefferson, the friend of France and sworn enemy of England, compelled to choose in the interest of America, never winced. Quote, 
the secession of Louisiana and the Floridas by Spain to France, end quote, he wrote to Livingston, the American minister in Paris, quote, works sorely on the United States. It completely reverses all the political relations of the United States and will form a new epoch in our political course. There is on the globe one single spot, the possessor of which is our natural and habitual enemy. It is New Orleans, through which the produce of three-eighths of our territory must pass to market. France, placing herself in that door, assumes to us an attitude of defiance. Spain might have retained it quietly for years. Her pacific dispositions, her feeble state, would induce her to increase our facilities there. Not so can it ever be in the hands of France. The day that France takes possession of New Orleans fixes the sentence which is to restrain her forever within her low water mark. It seals the union of the two nations who in conjunction can maintain exclusive possession of the ocean. From that moment we must marry ourselves to the British fleet and nation. This is not a state of things we seek or desire. It is one which the measure, if adopted by France, forces on us as necessarily as any other cause by the laws of nature brings on its necessary effect. End quote. Louisiana purchased. Acting on this belief, but apparently seeing only the Mississippi outlet at stake, Jefferson sent his friend, James Monroe, to France with the power to buy New Orleans and West Florida. Before Monroe arrived, the regular minister, Livingston, had already convinced Napoleon that it would be well to sell territory which might be wrested from him at any moment by British sea power, especially as the war, temporarily stopped by the peace of Amiens, was once more raging in Europe. Wise as he was in his day, Livingston had at first no thought of buying the whole Louisiana country, he was simply dazed when Napoleon offered to sell the entire domain and get rid of the business altogether. Though staggered by the proposal, he and Monroe decided to accept. On April 30, they signed the Treaty of Session, agreeing to pay $11,250,000 in six per cent bonds, and to discharge certain debts due French citizens, making in all approximately fifteen millions. Spain protested, Napoleon's brother fumed, French newspapers objected, but the deed was done. Jefferson and his constitutional scruples when the news of this extraordinary event reached the United States, the people were filled with astonishment, and no one was more surprised than Jefferson himself. He had thought of buying New Orleans and West Florida for a small sum, and now a vast domain had been dumped into the lap of the nation. He was puzzled. On looking into the Constitution, he found not a line authorizing the purchase of more territory, and so he drafted an amendment declaring, quote, Louisiana, as ceded by France, 
a part of the United States, end quote. He had belabored the Federalists for piling up a big national debt, and he could hardly endure the thought of issuing more bonds himself. In the midst of his doubts came the news that Napoleon might withdraw from the bargain. Thoroughly alarmed by that, Jefferson pressed the Senate for a ratification of the treaty. He still clung to his original idea that the Constitution did not warrant the purchase, but he lamely concluded, quote, If our friends shall think differently, I shall certainly acquiesce with satisfaction, confident that the good sense of our country will correct the evil of the construction when it shall produce ill effects. End quote. Thus, the stanch advocate of quote, strict interpretation cut loose from his own doctrine and entrusted the construction of the Constitution to quote, the good sense end quote, of his countrymen. The Treaty Ratified This unusual transaction, so favorable to the West, aroused the ire of the seaboard Federalists. Some denounced it as unconstitutional, easily forgetting Hamilton's masterly defense of the bank, also not mentioned in the Constitution. Others urged that if, quote, the howling wilderness, end quote, ever should be settled, it would turn against the East, form new commercial connections, and escape from federal control. Still others protested that the purchase would lead inevitably to the dominance of a quote, hodgepodge of wild men from the far west. End quote. Federalists who thought quote, the broad back of America end quote, could readily bear Hamilton's consolidated debt now went into agonies over a bond issue of less than one-sixth of that amount. But in vain, Jefferson's party, with a high hand, carried the day. The Senate, after hearing the Federalist protest, ratified the treaty. In December, 1803, the French flag was hauled down from the old government buildings in New Orleans, and the stars and stripes were hoisted as a sign that the land of Coronado, De Soto, Marquette, and La Salle had passed forever to the United States. By a single stroke, the original territory of the United States was more than doubled, while the boundaries of the purchase were uncertain, it is safe to say that the Louisiana Territory included what is now Arkansas, Missouri, Iowa, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, and large portions of Louisiana, Minnesota, North Dakota, Colorado, Montana, and Wyoming. The farmlands that the friends of, quote, a little America, end quote, on the seacoast declared a hopeless wilderness were, within a hundred years, fully occupied and valued at nearly seven billion dollars, almost five hundred times the price paid to Napoleon. Western explorations. Having taken the fateful step, Jefferson wisely began to make the most of it. He prepared for the opening of the new country by sending the Lewis and Clark expedition to explore it, discover its resources, and lay out an overland route through the Missouri Valley and across the Great Divide 
to the Pacific. The story of this mighty exploit, which began in the spring of 1804 and ended in autumn of 1806, was set down with skill and pains in the journal of Lewis and Clark. When published, even in short form, it invited the forward-looking men of the East to take thought about the Western Empire. At the same time, Zebulon Pike, in a series of journeys, explored the sources of the Mississippi River and penetrated the Spanish territories of the far southwest. Thus, scouts and pioneers continued the work of diplomats. End of section six, recorded by Robert. Sk Section number seven of The History of the U.S. Part three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Scott. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard, Part 3, Section 7. The Republican War for Commercial Independence The English and French Blockades in addition to bringing Louisiana to the United States, the reopening of the European War in 1803, after a short lull, renewed in an accurate form the commercial difficulties that had plagued the country all during the administrations of Washington and Adams. The Republicans were now plunged into the hornet's nest, the party, whose ardent spirits had burned Jay in effigy, stoned Hamilton for defending his treaty, jeered Washington's proclamation of neutrality, and spoken bitterly of, quote, timid traitors, could no longer take refuge in criticism. It had to act. Its troubles took a serious turn in 1806. England, in a determined effort to bring France to her knees by starvation, declared the coast of Europe blockaded from Brest to the mouth of the Elbe River. Napoleon, retaliated by his Berlin Decree of November 1806, blockading the British Isles, a measure terrifying to American shipowners whose vessels were liable to seizure by any French rover, though Napoleon had no navy to make good his proclamation. Great Britain countered with a still more irritating decree. The orders in Council of 1807 it modified its blockade, but in so doing merely authorized American ships not carrying munitions of war to complete their voyage to the continent, on condition of their stopping at a British port, securing a license, and paying a tax. This, responded Napoleon, was the height of insolence and he denounced it as a gross violation of international law. He then closed the circle of American troubles by issuing his Milan Decree of December 1807. This order declared that any ship 
which complied with the British rules, would be subject to seizure and confiscation by French authorities. THE IMPRESSMENT OF SEAMEN That was not all. Great Britain, in dire need of men for her navy, adopted the practice of stopping American ships, searching them, and carrying away British-born sailors found on board. British sailors were so badly treated, so cruelly flogged for trivial causes, and so meanly fed that they fled in crowds to the American marine. In many cases, it was difficult to tell whether seamen were English or American. They spoke the same language, so that language was no test. Rovers on the deep and stragglers in the ports of both countries they frequently had no papers to show their nativity. Moreover, Great Britain held to the one rule, quote, once an Englishman, always an Englishman, a doctrine rejected by the United States in favor of the principle that a man could choose the nation to which he would give allegiance. British sea captains, sometimes by mistake, and often enough with reckless indifference, carried away into servitude in their own navy genuine American citizens. The process itself, even when executed with all the civilities of law, was painful enough, for it meant that American ships were forced to, quote, come to, and compelled to, rest submissively under British guns until the searching party had pried into records, questioned seamen, seized and handcuffed victims. Saints could not have done this work without raising angry passions, and only saints could have endured it with patience and fortitude. Had the enactment of the scenes been confined to the high seas and knowledge of them to rumors and newspaper stories, American resentment might not have been so intense. But many a search and seizure was made in sight of land. British and French vessels patrolled the coasts, firing on one another, and chasing one another in American waters, within the three-mile limit. When, in the summer of 1807, the American frigate, Chesapeake, refused to surrender men alleged to be deserters from King George's Navy, the British warship, Leopard, opened fire, killing three men and wounding eighteen more, an act which even the British ministry could hardly excuse. If the French were less frequently the offenders, it was not because of their own tenderness about American rights, but because so few of their ships escaped the hawk-eyed British Navy to operate in American waters. THE LOSSES IN AMERICAN COMMERCE This high-handed conduct on the part of European belligerents was very injurious to American trade. By their enterprise, American shippers had become the foremost carriers on the Atlantic Ocean. In a decade, they had doubled the tonnage of American merchant ships under the American flag, taking the place of the French marine when Britain swept that from the seas, and supplying Britain with the sinews of war for the contest with Napoleonic Empire. The American shipping engagement in foreign trade embraced 
three hundred and sixty three thousand one hundred and ten tons in nineteen seventy one six hundred sixty nine thousand nine hundred and twenty one tons in eighteen hundred and almost one million tons in eighteen ten such was the enterprise attacked by the British and French decrees. American ships, bound for Great Britain, were liable to be captured by French privateers, which, in spite of the disasters of the Nile and Trafalgar, ranged the seas. American ships, destined for the continent, if they failed to stop, at British ports and pay tribute were in great danger of capture by the sleepless British navy in its swarm of auxiliaries. American sea captains who in fear of British vengeance heeded the orders in council and paid the tax were almost certain to fall a prey to French vengeance for the French were vigorous in executing the Milan Decree. Jefferson's Policy The President's dilemma was distressing. Both the belligerents in Europe were guilty of depredations on American commerce. War on both of them was out of the question. War on France was impossible because she had no territory on this side of the water which could be reached by American troops, and her naval forces had been shattered at the battles of the Nile and Trafalgar. War on Great Britain, a power which Jefferson's followers feared and distrusted, was possible but not inviting. Jefferson shrank from it. A man of peace, he disliked war's brazen clamor. A man of kindly spirit, he was startled at the death and destruction which it brought in its train. So for the eight years, Jefferson steered an even course, suggesting measure after measure with a view to avoiding bloodshed. He sent, it is true, Commodore Preble, in 1803, to punish Mediterranean pirates preying upon American commerce. But a great war he evaded with passionate earnestness, trying, in its place, every other expedient to protect American rights. The Embargo and Non-Intercourse Acts in 1806, Congress passed, and Jefferson approved, a Non-Importation Act closing American ports to certain products from British dominions. A measured intent as a club over the British government's head. This law, failing in its purpose, Jefferson proposed and Congress adopted in December 1807, the Embargo Act, forbidding all vessels to leave American harbors for foreign ports. France and England were to be brought to terms by cutting off their supplies. The result of the embargo was pathetic. England and France refused to give up search and seizure. American ship owners, who, lured by huge profits, had formerly been willing to take the risk, were now restrained by law to their home ports. Every section suffered. The South and West found their markets for cotton, rice, tobacco, corn, and bacon curtailed. Thus, they learned by bitter experience the national significance of commerce. 
shipmasters, shipbuilders, longshoremen, and sailors were thrown out of employment while the prices of foreign goods doubled. Those who obeyed the law were ruined. Violators of the law smuggled goods into Canada and Florida for shipment abroad. Jefferson's friends accepted the medicine with a wry face as the only alternative to supine submission or open war. His opponents, without offering any solution of their own, denounced it as a contemptible plan that brought neither relief nor honor, beset by the clamor that arose on all sides. Congress, in the closing days of Jefferson's administration, repealed the embargo law and substituted a non-intercourse act, forbidding trade with England and France while permitting it with other countries. A measure equally futile in staying the depredations on American shipping. Jefferson retires in favor of Madison. Jefferson, exhausted by endless wrangling and wounded, as Washington had been by savage circumstance, welcomed March 4, 1809. His friends urged him to, quote, stay by the ship, end quote, and accept a third term. He declined, saying that election for life might result from repeated re-election. In following Washington's course and defending it on principle, he set an example to all his successors, making the, quote, third term doctrine, end quote, a part of American unwritten law. His intimate friend, James Madison, to whom he turned over the burdens of his high office, was, like himself, a man of peace. Madison had been a leader since the days of the Revolution, but in legislative halls and council chambers, not on the field of battle. Small in stature, sensitive in in feelings, studious in habits, he was no man for the rough and tumble of practical politics. He had taken a prominent and distinguished part in the framing and the adoption of the Constitution. He had served in the First Congress as a friend of Hamilton's measures. Later, he attracted himself to Jefferson's fortunes and served for eight years as his first counselor, the Secretary of State. The principles of the Constitution, which he had helped to make and interpret, he was now, as President, called upon to apply in one of the most perplexing moments in all American history. In keeping with his own traditions, and following in the footsteps of Jefferson, he vainly tried to solve the foreign problem by negotiation. The Trend of Events Whatever difficulties Madison had in making up his mind on war and peace were settled by events beyond his own control. In the spring of 1811, a British frigate held up an American ship near the harbor of New York and impressed a seaman alleged to be an American citizen. Burning with resentment, the captain of the President, an American warship, acting under orders, poured several broadsides into the Little Belt, a British sloop suspected of being the guilty party. The British also encouraged the Indian chief Tecumseh, 
who wielded together the Indians of the Northwest under British protection, and gave signs of restlessness, presaging a revolt. This sent a note of alarm along the frontier that was not checked even when, in November, Tecumseh's men were badly beaten at Tippecanoe by William Henry Harrison. The Indians stood in the way of the advancing frontier, and it seemed to the pioneers that without support from the British in Canada, the red men would soon be subdued. Clay and Calhoun While events were moving swiftly and rumors were flying thick and fast, the mastery of the government passed from the uncertain hands of Madison to a party of ardent young men in Congress, dubbed, quote, Young Republicans under the leadership of two members destined to be mighty figures in American history, Henry Clay of Kentucky and John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. The former contended, in a flare of folly, that, quote, the militia of Kentucky alone are competent to place Montreal and Upper Canada at your feet. End quote. The latter, with a light heart, spoke of conquering Canada in four weeks' campaign. Quote, it must not be inferred, end quote, says Channing, quote, that in advocating conquest, the Westerners were actuated merely by desire for land. They welcomed war because they thought it would be the easiest way to abate Indian troubles. The savages were supported by their fur-trading interests that centered at Quebec and London. The Southerners, on their part, wished for Florida, and they thought that the conquest of Canada would obviate some northern opposition to this acquisition of slave territory, end quote. While Clay and Calhoun, spokesmen of the West and South, were not unmindful of what Napoleon had done to American commerce, they knew that their followers still remembered with deep gratitude the aid of the French in the war for independence, and that the embers of the old hatred for George the Third, still on the throne, could be readily blown into flame. Madison accepts war as inevitable. The conduct of the British ministers, with whom Madison had to deal, did little to encourage him in adhering to the policy of, quote, watchful waiting. One of them, a high Tory, believed that all Americans were alike, quote, except that a few are less knaves than others, end quote, and his methods were colored by his belief. On the recall of this minister, the British government selected another, no less high and mighty, in his principles and opinions. So, Madison became thoroughly discouraged about the outcome of Pacific measures. When the pressure from Congress upon him became too heavy, he gave way, signing on June 18, 1812, the declaration of war on Great Britain. In proclaiming hostilities, the administration set forth the causes which justified the declaration. Namely, the British had been encouraging the Indians to attack American citizens on the frontier. They had ruined American trade by blockades. They had insulted the American flag by stopping and searching our ships. 
they had illegally seized American sailors and driven them into the British Navy. THE COURSE OF WAR The war lasted for nearly three years without bringing victory to either side. The surrender of Detroit by General Hull to the British and the failure of American invasion of Canada were offset by Perry's victory on Lake Erie and a decisive blow administered to British designs for an invasion of New York by way of Plattsburgh. The triumph of Jackson at New Orleans helped to atone for the humiliation suffered in the burning of the capital by the British. The stirring deeds of the Constitution, the United States, and the Argus on the seas, the heroic death of Lawrence, and the victories of a hundred privateers furnished consolation for those who suffered from the iron blockade firmly established by the British government when it came to appreciate the gravity of the situation. While men love the annals of the sea, they will turn to the running battles, the narrow escapes, and the reckless daring of American sailors in that naval contest with Great Britain. All this was exciting, but it was inconclusive. In fact, never was a government less prepared than was that of the United States in 1812. It had neither the disciplined troops, the ships of war, nor the supplies required by the magnitude of the military task. It was fortune that favored the American cause. Great Britain, harassed, worn, and financially embarrassed by nearly twenty years of fighting in Europe, was in no mood to gather her forces for a titanic effort in America, even after Napoleon was overthrown and sent into exile at Elba in the spring of 1814. War clouds still hung on the European horizon, and the conflict, temporarily halted, did again break out. To be rid of American anxieties and free for European eventualities, England was ready to settle with the United States, especially as that could be done without conceding anything or surrendering any claims. THE TREATY OF PEACE Both countries were in the truth sick of a war that offered neither glory nor profit. Having indulged in the usual diplomatic skirmishing, they sent representatives to Ghent to discuss terms of peace. After long negotiations, an agreement was reached on Christmas Eve 1814, a few days before Jackson's victory at New Orleans. When the treaty reached America, the people were surprised to find that it said nothing about the seizure of American sailors, the destruction of American trade, the searching of American ships, or the support of Indians on the frontier. Nevertheless, we are told the people, quote, passed from gloom to glory, end quote, when the news of the peace arrived. The bells were rung, schools were closed, flags were displayed, and many a rousing toast was drunk in tavern and private home. The rejoicing could continue. With Napoleon definitely beaten at Waterloo in June 1815, Great Britain had no need to impress sailors, search ships, and confiscate American goods bound to the continent. Once more, 
the terrible sea power sank into the background, and the ocean was again white with the sails of merchantmen. End of section seven. Section 8 of the History of the U.S. Part 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the United States by Charles A. Beard and Mary Ritter Beard Part 3 Section 8 The Republicans Nationalized The Federalists Discredited By a strange turn of fortune's wheel, the party of Hamilton, Washington, Adams, the party of the grand nation, became the party of provincialism and nullification. New England finding its shipping interests crippled in the European conflict and then penalized by embargoes, opposed the declaration of war on Great Britain, which meant the completion of the ruin already begun. In the course of the struggle, the Federalist leaders came perilously near to treason in their efforts to hamper the government of the United States and, in their desperation, they fell back upon the doctrine of nullification, so recently condemned by them when it came from Kentucky. The Senate of Massachusetts, while the war was in progress, resolved that it was waged, quote, without justifiable cause, end quote, and refused to approve military and naval projects not connected with, quote, the defense of our seacoast and soil, end quote. A Boston newspaper declared that the Union was nothing but a treaty among sovereign states, that states could decide for themselves the question of obeying federal law and that armed resistance under the banner of a state would not be rebellion or treason. The General Assembly of Connecticut reminded the administration at Washington that, quote, the state of Connecticut is a free, sovereign, and independent state, end quote. Governor Morris, a member of the convention, which had drafted the Constitution, suggested the holding of another conference to consider whether the northern states should remain in the Union. In October 1814, a convention of delegates from Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and certain counties of New Hampshire and Vermont was held at Hartford, on the call of Massachusetts. The counsels of the extremists were rejected, but the convention solemnly went on, record, to the effect that acts of Congress in violation of the Constitution are void, that in cases of deliberate, dangerous, and palpable infractions, the state is duty-bound to interpose its authority for the protection of its citizens, and that when emergencies occur, the states must be their own judges and execute their own decisions. Thus, New England answered the challenge of Calhoun and Clay. Fortunately, its actions were not as rash as its words. The Hartford Convention merely proposed certain amendments to the Constitution, and adjourned. 
At the close of the war, its proposals vanished, harmlessly. But the men who made them were hopelessly discredited. THE SECOND UNITED STATES BANK In driving the Federalists toward nullification and waging a national war themselves, the Republicans lost all their old taint of provincialism. Moreover, in turning to measures of reconstruction called forth by the war, they resorted to the national devices of the Federalists. In 1816, they chartered, for a period of twenty years, a second United States Bank, the institution which Jefferson and Madison once had condemned as unsound and unconstitutional. The Constitution remained unchanged, times and circumstances had changed. Calhoun dismissed the vexed question of constitutionality with a scant reference to an ancient dispute, while Madison set aside his scruples and signed the bill. THE PROTECTIVE TARIFF OF 1816 The Republicans supplemented the bank by another Federalist measure, a high protective tariff. Clay viewed it as the beginning of his, quote, American system of protection. Calhoun defended it on national principles. For this sudden reversal of policy, the young Republicans were taunted by some of their older party colleagues with betraying the, quote, agricultural interest that Jefferson had fostered. But Calhoun refused to listen to their criticisms. Quote, when the seas are open, end quote, he said, quote, the produce of the South may pour anywhere into the markets of the Old World. What are the effects of a war with a maritime power, with England? Our commerce annihilated, our agriculture cut off from its accustomed markets. The surplus of the farmer perishes on his hands. The recent war fell with peculiar pressure on the growers of cotton and tobacco and the other great staples of the country. And the same state of things will reoccur in the event of another war unless prevented by the foresight of this body when our manufacturers are grown to a certain perfection, as they soon will be under the fostering care of the government. We shall no longer experience these evils. End quote. With the Republicans nationalized, the Federalist Party, as an organization, disappeared after a crushing defeat in the presidential campaign of 1816. Monroe and the Florida Purchase To the victor in that political contest, James Monroe of Virginia fell two tasks of national importance, adding to the prestige of the whole country and deepening the sense of patriotism that weaned men away from mere allegiance to the states. The first of these was the purchase of Florida from Spain. The acquisition of Louisiana let the Mississippi flow, quote, unvexed to the sea, end quote. But it left all the states east of the river cut off from the gulf affording them ground for discontent, akin to that which had moved the pioneers of Kentucky to action 
a generation earlier. The uncertainty as to the boundaries of Louisiana gave the United States a claim to West Florida, setting on foot a movement for occupation. The Florida swamps were a basis for Indian marauders who periodically swept into the frontier settlements and hiding places for runaway slaves. Thus, the sanction of international law was given to punitive expeditions into alien territory. The pioneer leaders stood waiting for the signal. It came. President Monroe, on the occasion of an Indian outbreak, ordered General Jackson to seize the offenders in the Floridas, if necessary. The high-spirited warrior, taking this as a hint that he was to occupy the coveted region, replied that, if possession was the object of the invasion, he could occupy the Floridas within sixty days. Without waiting for an answer to this letter, he launched his expedition, and in the spring of 1818 was master of the Spanish king's domain to the south. There was nothing for the king to do but to make the best of the inevitable by ceding the Floridas to the United States in return for five million dollars to be paid to American citizens having claims against Spain. On Washington's birthday, 1819, the treaty was signed. It ceded the Floridas to the United States and defined the boundary between Mexico and the United States by drawing a line from the mouth of the Sabine River in the northwesterly direction to the Pacific. On this occasion, even Monroe, former opponent of the Constitution, forgot to inquire whether new territory could be constitutionally acquired and incorporated into the American Union. The Republicans seemed far away from the days of, quote, strict construction. And Jefferson still lived. The Monroe Doctrine Even more effective in fashioning the national idea was Monroe's enunciation of the famous doctrine that bears his name. The occasion was another European crisis. During the Napoleonic upheaval and the years of dissolution that ensued, the Spanish colonies in America, following the example set by their English neighbors in 1776, declared their independence. Unable to conquer them alone, the King of Spain turned for help to the friendly powers of Europe that looked upon revolution and republics with undisguised horror. THE HOLY ALLIANCE He found them prepared to view his case with sympathy. Three of them, Austria, Prussia, and Russia, under the leadership of the Tsar, Alexander I, in the autumn of 1815, had entered into a holy alliance to sustain, by reciprocal service, the autocratic principle in government. Although the effusive, almost maudlin, language of the treaty did not express their purpose explicitly, the alliance was later regarded as a mere union of monarchs to prevent the rise and growth of popular government. The American people thought their worst fears confirmed when in 1822 a conference of delegates from Russia, Austria, Prussia, 
and France met at Verona to consider, among other things, revolutions that had just broken out in Spain and Italy. The spirit of the conference is reflected in the first article of the agreement reached by the delegates. Quote, the high contracting powers being convinced that the system of representative government is equally incompatible with the monarchical principle and the maxim of the sovereignty of the people with the divine right, mutually engaged in the most solemn manner to use all their efforts to put an end to the system of representative government in whatever country it may exist in Europe, and to prevent its being introduced in those countries where it is not yet known. End quote. The Tsar, who incidentally coveted the west coast of North America, proposed to send an army to aid the King of Spain in his troubles at home, thus preparing the way for intervention in Spanish America. It was material weakness, not want of spirit, that prevented the grand union of monarchs from making open war on popular government. The Position of England Unfortunately, too, for the Holy Alliance, England refused to cooperate. English merchants had built up a large trade with the independent Latin American colonies, and they protested against the restoration of Spanish sovereignty, which meant a renewal of Spain's former trade monopoly. Moreover, divine right doctrines had been laid to rest in England and the representative principle thoroughly established. Already there were signs of the coming democratic flood, which was soon to carry the first reform bill of 1832, extending the suffrage, and sweep on to even greater achievements. British statesmen, therefore, had to be cautious. In such circumstances, instead of cooperating with the autocrats of Russia, Austria, and Prussia, they turned to the Minister of the United States in London. The British Prime Minister, Canning, proposed that the two countries join in declaring their unwillingness to see the Spanish colonies transferred to any other power. Jefferson's Advice The proposal was rejected, but President Monroe took up the suggestion with Madison and Jefferson, as well as with his Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams. They favored the plan. Jefferson said, quote, One nation, most of all, could disturb us in the pursuit of freedom. She now offers to lead, aid, and accompany us in it. By acceding to her proposition, we detach her from the bands, bring her mighty weight into the scale of free government, and emancipate a continent at one stroke. With her on our side, we need not fear the whole world. With her, then, we should most sedulously cherish a cordial friendship. End quote. Monroe's Statement of the Doctrine Acting on the advice of trusted friends, President Monroe embodied in his message to Congress on December 2, 1823, a statement of principles now famous throughout the world as the Monroe Doctrine. To the autocrats of Europe, he announced that he would regard, quote, any attempt on their part to extend their system 
to any portion of this hemisphere as dangerous to our peace and safety. End quote. While he did not propose to interfere with existing colonies dependent on European powers, he ranged himself squarely on the side of those that had declared their independence. Any attempt by a European power to oppress them or control their destiny in any manner he characterized as Quote, a manifestation of an unfriendly disposition toward the United States. End quote. Referring to another part of his message, to a recent claim which the Tsar had made to the Pacific coast, President Monroe warned the old world that quote, the American continents by the free and independent condition which they had assumed and maintained, are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European powers. End quote. The effect of this declaration was immediate and profound. Men whose political horizon had been limited to a community or state were led to consider their nation as a great power among the sovereignties of the earth, taking its part in shaping their international relations. The Missouri Compromise Respecting one other important measure of this period, the Republicans also took a broad view of the obligations under the Constitution, namely, the Missouri Compromise. It is true they insisted on the admission of Missouri as a slave state, balanced against the free state of Maine, but at the same time they assented to the prohibition of slavery in the Louisiana Territory north of the line 36 degrees, 30 minutes. During the debate on the subject, an extreme view had been presented to the effect that Congress had no constitutional warrant for abolishing slavery in the territories. The precedent of the Northwest Ordinance, ratified by Congress in 1789, seemed a conclusive answer from practice to this contention. But Monroe submitted the issue to his cabinet, which included Calhoun of South Carolina, Crawford of Georgia, and Wirt of Virginia, all presumably adherents to the Jeffersonian principle of strict construction. He received in reply a unanimous verdict to the effect that Congress did have the power to prohibit slavery in the territories governed by it. Acting on this advice, he approved on March 6, 1820, the bill establishing freedom north of the Compromise Line. This generous interpretation of the powers of Congress stood for nearly forty years until repudiated by the Supreme Court in the Dred Scott case. End of Section 8 Rec Section 8 of History of the United States by Charles Beard and Mary Ritter Beard, Part 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio, June 2007. The National Decisions of Chief Justice Marshall 
John Marshall, the Nationalist The Republicans in the lower ranges of state politics, who did not catch the grand national style of their leaders charged with responsibilities in the national field, were assisted in their education by a Federalist from the Old Dominion, John Marshall, who, as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States from 1810 to 1835, lost no occasion to exalt the Constitution above the claims of the provinces. No differences of opinion as to its political views have ever led even his warmest opponents to deny his superior abilities or his sincere devotion to the national idea. All will likewise agree that for talents, native and acquired, he was an ornament to the humble democracy that brought him forth. His whole career was American. Born on the frontier of Virginia, reared in a log cabin, granted only the barest rudiments of education, inured to hardship and rough life, he rose by masterly efforts to the highest judicial honor America can bestow. On him the bitter experience of the Revolution and of later days made a lasting impression. He was no, quote, summer patriot. He had been a soldier in the Revolutionary Army. He had suffered with Washington at Valley Forge. He had seen his comrades in arms starving and freezing because the Continental Congress had neither the power nor the inclination to force the states to do their full duty. To him the Articles of Confederation were the symbol of futility. Into the struggle for the formation of the Constitution and its ratification in Virginia, he had thrown himself with the ardor of a soldier. Later, as a member of Congress, a representative to France, and Secretary of State, he had aided the Federalists in establishing the new government. When at length they were driven from power in the executive and legislative branches of the government, he was chosen for their last stronghold, the Supreme Court. By historic irony, he administered the oath of office to his bitterest enemy, Thomas Jefferson, and long after the author of the Declaration of Independence had retired to private life, the stern Chief Justice continued to announce the old Federalist principles from the Supreme Bench. Marbury versus Madison An Act of Congress Annulled He had been in his high office only two years when he laid down for the first time in the name of the entire court the doctrine that the judges have the power to declare an act of Congress null and void when, in their opinion, it violates the Constitution. This power was not expressly conferred on the court. Though many able men held that the judicial branch of government enjoyed it, the principle was not positively established until 1803, when the case of Marbury v. Madison was decided. In rendering the opinion of the court, Marshall cited no precedents. He sought no foundations for his argument in ancient history. He rested it on the general nature of the American system. The Constitution, ran his reasoning, is the supreme law of the land. It limits and binds all who act in the name of the United States. It limits the powers of Congress and defines the rights of citizens. If Congress can ignore its limitations and trespass upon the rights of citizens, Marshall argued, then the Constitution disappears and Congress is supreme. Since, however, the Constitution is supreme and superior to Congress, it is the duty of judges, under their oath of office, to sustain it against measures which violate it. Therefore, from the nature of the American constitutional system, the courts must declare null and void all acts which are not authorized. Quote, a law repugnant to the Constitution, he closed, is void and the courts as well as other departments are bound by that instrument. End quote. From that day to this, the practice of federal and state courts in passing upon the constitutionality of laws has remained unshaken. This doctrine was received by Jefferson and many of his followers with consternation. If the idea was sound, he exclaimed, quote, Then indeed is our Constitution a complete fellow de se, legally a suicide, for intending to establish three departments, coordinate and independent, that they might check and balance one another, 
It has given, according to this opinion, to one of them alone the right to prescribe rules for the government of the others, and to that one, too, which is unelected by it and independent of the nation. The Constitution, on this hypothesis, is a mere thing of wax in the hands of the judiciary, which they may twist and shape into any form they please. It should be remembered, as an axiom of eternal truth in politics, that whatever power in any government is independent is absolute also. A judiciary independent of a king or executive alone is a good thing, but independence of the will of the nation is a solecism, at least in a republican government. End quote. But Marshall was mighty, and his view prevailed, though from time to time other men, clinging to Jefferson's opinion, likewise opposed the exercise by the courts of the high power of passing upon the constitutionality of acts of Congress. Acts of State Legislatures Declared Unconstitutional Had Marshall stopped with the annulling and the act of Congress, he would have heard less criticism from Republican quarters, but with the same firmness he set aside acts of state legislatures as well, whenever, in his opinion, they violated the federal Constitution. In 1810, in the case of Fletcher v. Peck, he annulled an act of the Georgia legislature, informing the state that it was not sovereign but, quote, a part of a large empire a member of the American Union, and that Union has a Constitution, which imposes limits to the legislatures of the several states, end quote. In the case of McCullough v. Maryland, decided in 1819, he declared void an act of the Maryland legislature designed to paralyze the branches of the United States Bank established in that state. In the same year, in the still more memorable Dartmouth College case, he annulled an act of the New Hampshire legislature which infringed upon the charter received by the college from King George long before. That charter, he declared, was a contract between the state and the college, which the legislature under the federal constitution could not impair. Two years later, he stirred the wrath of Virginia by summoning her to the bar of the Supreme Court to answer in a case which the validity of one of her laws was involved, and then justified his action in a powerful opinion rendered in the case of Cohen's versus Virginia. All these decisions aroused the legislatures of the states. They passed sheaves of resolutions protesting and condemning, but Marshall never turned and never stayed. The Constitution of the United States, he fairly thundered at them, is the supreme law of the land. The Supreme Court is the proper tribunal to pass finally upon the validity of the laws of the states, and, quote, those sovereignties, end quote, far from possessing the right of review and nullification, are irrevocably bound by the decisions of that court. This was strong medicine for the authors of the Kentucky and Virginia Resolutions and for the members of the Hartford Convention, but they had to take it. The Doctrine of Implied Powers While restraining Congress in the Marbury case and the state legislatures in a score of cases, Marshall also laid the judicial foundation for a broad and liberal view of the Constitution as opposed to the narrow and strict construction. In McCullough v. Maryland, he construed generously the words, quote, necessary and proper, in such a way as to confer upon Congress a wide range of, quote, implied powers, in addition to their express powers. That case involved, among other things, the question whether an act establishing the Second United States Bank was authorized by the Constitution. Marshall answered in the affirmative. Congress, ran his reasoning, has large powers over taxation and the currency. A bank is of appropriate use in the exercise of these enumerated powers, and therefore, Though not absolutely necessary, a bank is entirely proper and constitutional. Quote, With respect to the means by which the powers that the Constitution confers are to be carried into execution, he said, Congress must be allowed the discretion which, quote, will enable that body to perform the high duties assigned to it in the manners most beneficial to the people, end quote. In short, 
The Constitution of the United States is not a straitjacket, but a flexible instrument vesting in Congress the powers necessary to meet the national problems as they arise. In delivering this opinion, Marshall used language almost identical with that employed by Lincoln when, standing on the battlefield of a war waged to preserve the nation, he said that, quote, a government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Summary of the Union and National Politics During the strenuous period between the establishment of American independence and the advent of Jacksonian democracy, the great American experiment was under the direction of the men who had launched it. All the presidents in that period, except John Quincy Adams, had taken part in the Revolution. James Madison, the chief author of the Constitution, lived until 1836. This age, therefore, was the, quote, age of the fathers. It saw the threatened ruin on the country under the Articles of Confederation, the formation of the Constitution, the rise of political parties, the growth of the West, the Second War with England, and the apparent triumph of the national spirit over sectionalism. The New Republic had hardly been started in 1783 before its troubles began. The government could not raise money to pay its debts or running expenses. It could not protect American commerce and manufacturers against European competition. It could not stop the continual issues of paper money by the states. It could not intervene to put down domestic uprisings that threatened the existence of the state governments. Without money, without an army, without courts of law, the Union under the Articles of Confederation was drifting into dissolution. Patriots, who had risked their lives for independence, began to talk of monarchy again. Washington, Hamilton, and Madison insisted that a new constitution alone could save America from disaster. By dint of much labor, the friends of a new form of government induced the Congress to call a national convention to take into account the state of America. In May 1787, it assembled at Philadelphia and for months had debated and wrangled over plans for a constitution. The small states clamored for equal rights in the Union. The large states vowed that they would never grant it. A spirit of conciliation, fair play, and compromise saved the convention from breaking up. In addition, there were jealousies between the planting states and the commercial states. Here, too, compromises had to be worked out. Some of the delegates feared the growth of democracy, and others cherished it. These factions also had to be placated. At last, the plan of government was drafted, the Constitution of the United States, and submitted to the states for approval. Only after a long and acrimonious debate did enough states ratify the instrument to put it into effect. On April 30, 1789, George Washington was inaugurated first president. The new government proceeded to fund the old debt of the nation, assume the debts of the states, found the national bank, lay heavy taxes to pay the bills, and enact laws protecting American industry and commerce. Hamilton led the way, but he had not gone far before he encountered opposition. He found the formidable antagonist in Jefferson. In time, two political parties appear full-armed upon the scene, the Federalist and the Republicans. For ten years they filled the country with political debate. In 1800, the Federalists were utterly vanquished by the Republicans, with Jefferson in the lead. By their proclamations of faith, the Republicans favored the states rather than the new national government. But in practice, they added immensely to the prestige and power of the nation. They purchased Louisiana from France, they waged a war for commercial independence against England, they created a second United States Bank. They enacted the Protective Tariff of 1816. They declared that Congress had the power to abolish slavery north of the Missouri Compromise Line. And they spread the shield of the Monroe Doctrine between the Western Hemisphere and Europe. Still, America was part of a European civilization. Currents of opinion flowed to and fro across the Atlantic. Friends of popular government in Europe looked to America as the great exemplar of their ideals. 
Events in Europe reacted upon thought in the United States. The French Revolution exerted a profound influence on the course of political debate. While it was in the stage of mere reform, all Americas favored it. When the king was executed and a radical democracy set up, American opinion was divided. When France fell under the military dominion of Napoleon and preyed upon American commerce, the United States made ready for war. The conduct of England likewise affected American affairs. In 1793, war broke out between England and France and raged with only slight intermission until 1815. England and France both ravaged American commerce. But England was the more serious offender because she had command of the seas. Though Jefferson and Madison strove for peace, the country was swept into war by the vehemence of the young Republicans, headed by Clay and Calhoun. When the armed conflict was closed, one in diplomacy opened. The autocratic powers of Europe threatened to intervene on behalf of Spain in her attempt to recover possession of her Latin American colonies. Their challenge to America brought forth the Monroe Doctrine. The powers of Europe were warned not to interfere with the independence or the republican policies of this hemisphere, or to attempt any new colonization in it. It seemed that nationalism was to have a peaceful triumph over sectionalism. References H. Adams, History of the United States, 1800-1817 Casey Babcock, Rise of American Nationality, E. Channing, The Jeffersonian System, D.C. Gilman, James Monroe, W. Redaway, The Monroe Doctrine, T. Roosevelt, Naval War of 1812. Questions. What was the leading feature of Jefferson's political theory? 2. Enumerate the chief means of his administration. 3. Were the Jeffersonians able to apply their theories? Give the reasons. 4. Explain the importance of the Mississippi River to Western farmers. 5. Show how events in Europe forced the Louisiana Purchase. 6. State the constitutional question involved in the Louisiana Purchase. 7. Show how American trade was affected by the European War. 8. Compare the policies of Jefferson and Madison. 9. Why did the United States become involved with England rather than with France? 10. Contrast the causes of the War of 1812 with the results. 11. Give the economic reasons for the attitude of New England. 12. Give five, quote, nationalist, end quote, measures of the Republicans. Discuss each in detail. 13. Sketch the career of John Marshall. 14. Discuss the case of Marbury v. Madison. 15. Summarize Marshall's views on a. states' rights and b. a liberal interpretation of the Constitution. Research Topics The Louisiana Purchase Text of Treaty and MacDonald Documentary Source Book, page 279-282 Source Materials in Heart, American History Told by Contemporaries, Volume 3, pages 363 to 384. Narrative, Henry Adams, History of the United States, Volume 2, pages 25 to 115. Elson, History of the United States, pages 383 to 388. The Embargo and Non-Intercourse Acts. MacDonald, pages 282 to 288. Adams, Volume 4, pages 152 to 177. Elson, pages 394 to 405. Congress in the War of 1812. Adams, Volume 6, pages 113 to 198. Elson, pages 408 to 450. Proposals of the Hartford Convention. MacDonald, pages 293 to 302. Manufacturers and the Tariff of 1816. Coman, Industrial History of the United States, pages 184 to 194. The Second United States Bank. MacDonald, pages 302 to 306. Effect of the European War on American Trade. Calendar, Economic History of the United States, pages 240 to 250. The Monroe Message. 
MacDonald, pages 318 to 320. Lewis and Clark Expedition. R.G. Thwaites, Rocky Mountain Explorations, pages 92 to 187. Schaefer, A History of the Pacific Northwest. Revised Edition, pages 29 to 61. End of Section 8. End of United States History by Charles and Mary Beard, Part 3.